This is the Powerlifting America podcast, and today we got part two of our recap of the IPF Classic World Championships with experts Julia Williams and Mike Gold. This was the biggest and most exciting world championships in IPF history, and although it was a tough competition, the USA won the team points on both the women and the men's side, took home the most gold medals, the most medals overall, and the best lifter, Natalie Richards. Congratulations to everyone who competed and all of the countries involved. Part two covers the most impressive and most slept on performances and the day-by-day recap of all 16 weight classes. Before we start, we are four weeks out from the biggest North American championships ever with 286 athletes competing from 14 countries all headed to the Cayman Islands. Our team is stacked with superstars like Ray Williams, Claire Zai, Lane Norton, Susie Hartwig Gary, and Steve Mann. We've got 108 Powerlifting America athletes going across all age divisions, both raw and equipped. Two weeks after that, it's the Sub Junior and Junior World Championships in Romania, and we have a loaded team for that as well. We'll have a media team on the ground at both competitions, delivering press conferences, interviews, behind the scenes coverage, and more. So be sure to subscribe to our YouTube and to follow us on Instagram at powerlifting underscore America so you don't miss any of it. If you want to show love for the squad, head over to our store and get a hat or get a shirt so you can wear it and cheer on Team USA. Thank you to SBD and Aleco for the continued partnership with Powerlifting America. If you're looking to compete in drug tests of powerlifting, whether you're just starting out or you want to compete with the best in the world, make sure you go to powerlifting-america.com and become a member. Now, let's get to part two of this recap of the IPF Classic World Championships. We're back. It's been like a week. Things have happened. Off the top, is there any controversial topic, anything that you want to talk about that's popped up this week? I guess one thing I would mention, I just recently heard uh, on a podcast, so might as well uh, mention it, is somebody was making a claim that um, all these lifters are saying that they're switching to the IPF. And the claim was that, no, they're not switching to the IPF. They're switching to Power of the America. Only eight of them are going to be going to Worlds. So I just like to point out that there are other international competitions and we are sending a team to the NAPFs, including Ray Williams, Bryce Lewis, a bunch of other superstars. Tristan, so Tristan Nazelrod, actually Bryce Lewis isn't going, but um, Tristan Nazelrod, Mike T, uh, Jonathan Garcia finished seconds at, at Worlds last year. Um, Claire Zai on the women's side, Julia Williams here as well will be there. So yeah, like an absolutely a good a great roster. Um, exactly what they were talking about on that podcast. We're talking about the two white lights podcast, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but um, they basically were just saying that like if you come to Powerlifting in America, that you're just gonna do nationals and that's all there is for you. But no, you can actually do the UK Arnold. You can actually do like any other country's nationals or regional meets as a guest lifter, which is basically the same thing as like the doing going to like South Korea and doing a meet or like going to Australia and doing a meet. Like there's some uh we're we're in talks to do like an exchange possibly with Australia with their nationals, all kinds of things going on. Um, you know, all, all of it is still up in the air, but, um, there's tons of international meets and NAPF being the biggest and most important. We're taking like, I want to say like it's over 120 athletes, uh, to the North American powerlifting championships. That'll be in the Cayman islands of all places. Like an amazing, like talk about like, um, you know, a good location to have a competition. It's going to be fantastic. And then people also forget, like, there's a lot of other IPF competitions. Like we've got, if you're a junior, if you're a sub junior, if you're a master, um, we're taking, you know, hundreds of athletes, uh, to these competitions, masters, um, in APF. And then of course, junior and sub junior world championships has a bunch of lifters as well. What does it have? Like over 60, um, lifters, something like that. So there's a lot of different options for international competitions. And then obviously domestically, we're going to have some bigger and bigger domestic, like national type, uh, local meets happening as well. That will be like, you know, the t- type of bigger meets that you see in other federations as well, but be local meets basically, or, or like local t- or regional type of meet. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. Um, what was your, what did you think about that, Julia? Did you hear that? Um, I did not, but yeah, I mean, I, I would say that if anything, um, being in power of America gives you more chance for international opportunities or more chance for big meets that aren't nationals than, than um, other fets. Um, you know, like invitational meets are, are really fun and you can get a lot of big names there, but, but they're not, um, you know, like sub junior worlds or, or NAPF or anything like that. They're, they're just their own thing that, that is, you know, um, a, a, a higher level of competition in a local meet. You know, um, so I think actually, you know, if you want to um, see what the global powerlifting community is like and you want more travel opportunities and um, all of that, then I think that Powerlifting America is probably a better track to take, especially if you are a sub-junior, junior, master's lifter. 
Definitely. And by the way, um, just a shameless plug, we're like four weeks out from NAPF in Cayman Islands. Uh, so it is going to be an exciting competition. Like I said, the roster for Team USA, I think we're taking basically a full team of, uh, of open lifters, uh, both men and women. And then, of course, we're taking like a ton of it's equipped. It's also classic. It's masters, it's juniors, sub juniors, full squad. So it's pretty cool. I'm pretty sure that this NAPF is going to be big. I know I was looking at the roster before and there's team Canada showing up with a lot of great lifters like Bryce Krawcheck is coming. Um, Eric, uh, what's his name? Eric Willis is coming as well. Um, there's a couple of other studs from Canada that are coming on both, you know, and then last year team Canada did really well at the NAPF and, um, and there's a bunch of other countries that do well as too. Dominican Republic has a good team. Panama has a good team, Costa Rica, Puerto Rico, Mexico. There's, there's these teams that you won't always see like huge squads, at um the ipf world championships and things like this they might only have a couple of lifters there but they bring big squads when it comes to napf so it's going to be cool i'm excited for everyone to just see like no look we do have this other amazing international meet um that a lot of people can go to and compete in and it does give our athletes that in poverty in america just another alternative besides just nationals um and then of course like i said there's things in the works for bigger domestic meets for power in america d bigger meets in the u.s for power in america that are coming down the road as well just takes time like we were talking julie and i were talking the other day that it's like power in america is still like a year and a half old um so just like the fact that we've already taken like probably you know over 300 athletes overseas to different competitions around the world and done everything that we've done in just a year and a half it's pretty amazing like just imagine where we're going to be in five years and imagine what the opportunities will be with power in america in five years mike you got any more spicy takes like this what else well, um, literally, as you set me talking, off, you set me off on that one. No, so I just thought I just saw a funny email um, from <laughs> Larry Maley. Um, oh, about how USAPL is try is about to introduce a World Cup for their um, United States Powerlifting Federation. It's very interesting. A World Cup for the for uh, well, for, well, for a national federation. It is pretty, but let's, let's let them do their, uh, do their thing. Um, no, I just thought it was funny because we were talking about inter international, like yeah. competition. As we speak, you get an email. Literally as we speak, I got an email and it talks about a world cup, but, um, world implies, um, not one country. So yeah. a little interesting, but anyway. Yeah. So, oh, Actually, I wanted to touch on that too, because we, t you mentioned in the last one, and I forgot to mention that, because I think you said there were like 40 countries at IPF worlds, uh, which is what this episode is about. The, we're actually are going to get to recapping the classic world championships in Malta. There's, there was 59 countries. Um, it's not 40, 59, and it was 169 women, 198 men. So pretty good numbers there that ultimately ended up competing. So that's pretty awesome. And like we said, you know, on the streams and everything like that, add them all up to 1.35 million as of last week. So who knows what it's at now, but definitely one of the biggest and most important competitions that's ever happened. Let's just put it at that. Um, and so let's go ahead and get back into what we're going to talk about. So first thing that we want to talk about is we kind of went over, you know, in the past, uh, on the previous episode, we went over just like our general reactions was the biggest things that happened, the storylines people will be talking about. Next thing we want is, what lifter impressed you the most? And um, I'm going to go ahead and take the easy one and just go first and like take the one that's pretty much undebatable, the most impressive lifter that happened that that was at the world championships. And that's Natalie Richards. And if we just look through her performance, you know, going nine for nine, 11 kilo total PR best lifter at the competition, close race with Corolla Gara, by the way, but other than a uh, Corolla Gara, you know, pretty handily one was in the clubhouse in the lead all week. And that lead held up. Um, but throughout the rest of the competition, which was amazing. And, um, she, you know, she also hit a uh, two and a half kilo squat PR, tighter bench PR, three and a half kilo deadlift PR. And she did it going against someone who's like super well seasoned. You want to talk about um, travel and the effect that travel has. She's going against Zsa Zsa Kabu, who's been traveling all over Europe, been, tra been at international competitions, has been to international um, IPF refereed events before like this. And Natalie came in and goes nine for nine, handles business. One of the greatest, one of the best, most brilliant performances from the entire competition. And it was her first time at the world championships. So it just kind of goes to show like, imagine, 
I mean, obviously you can't really get a much better performance than this. She already is like a savvy pro. I think that when people say that she's, it was her first time and that somehow makes it more impressive. It's like, she's been one of the best, if not the best American lifter for a while now, like for a couple of years now, people have just been sleeping on her. She hasn't, you know, always showed it on the platform last time at Mega Nats, whatnot, but still, I mean, she's one of the best and she had an amazing performance. So she impressed me the most, just, just her persona being around her, uh, being around her in the warm up room, how she handled herself. Like I was, I've been telling people like when she walks out to the platform, like she has like a swagger, like the way she walks. Like if you watch on YouTube, I'm kind of like impersonating, like she's got this like swagger to her. That's just different from anyone else. Um, she was super nervous throughout the day, but yet at the same time, like confident. And, um, I knew it meant a lot to her. I know she was super, super nervous, like coming into the competition. So for her to just put all that to bed, go nine for nine and handle business the way that she did. She's, she's my most impressive lifter. Do you guys have any argument with that? No, I don't, <laughs> I don't think you, I don't think you could argue with it. I mean, exactly. Every, everything you're saying is true. Yeah. It's pretty much, uh, Mrs. Undeniable, Miss Undeniable, however you want to say it. Um, but, uh, yeah, like spectacular performance. So, all right, let's pass it over to Julia. Who was your most impressed, uh, the lifter that impressed you the most? Okay, so I had two on the women's side that I was really impressed by, obviously, besides Natalie. Um, and they were Corolla and Evie. And I actually picked Evie because um, even though, you know, her performance wasn't, you know, that maybe like the talk of lift points or anything like that, um, there was a lot of speculation around if, you know, Sheffield was a one-time thing and or if she could really last in the 52s. And she really put that to bed because she totaled the same thing she did at Sheffield and she only needed eight attempts to do it. So um, I thought that that was, you know, probably the best answer that um, she could have given to um, those people who were, you know, maybe um, more critical of her or maybe just didn't think that she had what it takes to 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 stay on top of the 52. So to me, um, that kind of um, maturity and confidence on a platform like the world stage really, really impresses me. Um, but, you know, that being said, I, I also, um, like I said, it was tough. Um, it was close with uh, Corolla who, you know, also broke the world record um, with maybe uh, not many people thinking that she would. I know Mike uh, Mike said something about it. Um, and I was thinking it too, but I think a lot of people, um, their eyes were elsewhere. So those two really impressed me, but especially just Evie's ability to to answer um, to any to any speculation. That was Yeah. I'll give you another reason why I loved Evie's performance. Because without it, Power Team America and Team USA would not have won the team points. Um, she was effectively an honorary member of Team Power Team America, Team USA. And hats off to her. Thank you, Evie. Um, I said this to, to her in person. I gave her a Power Team America shirt. Like I said, I would, I believe on the preview show, I might've said something about that in advance. I did give her a shirt and everything. And um, yeah, I mean, thank, thank God for Evie, right? Like um, we needed her and it came, ended up coming down to a tie um, on team points. And without Evie's performance, Team USA would have lost. So amazing. Um, Mike, you got anything you want to add to that? Yeah. So um, my job is to say the things that other people don't want to say. <laughs> So, wait, wait, um, wait. We never specifically assigned you that job. You that's a I don't self appointed you. In, in general. In general. Yeah, yeah. Um so, I love um, you've given yourself this task. This is perfect yeah. though. So um before I get canceled, like the people at Sheffield did because they didn't give her the full credit, she had a wonderful performance and she's a great lifter. But um if we're talking about the most impressive performance, she matched what she did. She didn't put up anything, nothing surprising. She didn't like have a big bump on her total. She didn't go shatter a world record. Well, she, she didn't did put it. up one of the best good lift score. No, no, it was a very good performance. But eight it attempts, very, eight attempts. I mean, it, it was a, it was a very good performance. It was good enough to win worlds. It was great. She didn't miss any attempts. But if we're talking about most impressive performance, either yeah. to me, either it has to be something that like 
mine, I'll get to it soon, where it surprised people and came up out of nowhere, or something that even if you could have seen coming was just something that was just like something that like broke a world record, like shattered a world record or put up some crazy good look score. Like um, as much as like in general, the 52s have been making improvements recently. Some might say that is one of the like lagging weight classes. Like obviously formulas aren't great, but if you look at formulas, the winners of the 52s are like at the bottom of like the good lift scores. And even if you take formulas out of it, if you just look at like the gaps between the winner of the, um, of the 52s versus like the 57s, like it's like really far apart. So it was a very good performance and she's an amazing lifter, but I just like, I wouldn't put that as my most impressive performance. All right. Good, good arguments. I mean, he at least uh, backed it up with some, some good arguments there. I mean, I do think like she wasn't pushed. You can only do what you need to do. She did play the smart move um, at the world championships. It's not always about, you know, what having the biggest total, like it is at Sheffield where she might've taken that third deadlift and gone all out. And who knows, like broken the world record by maybe she can go up another five, six, seven keys from there. I don't know. I, I didn't see exactly how fast it moved. It sounded like it moved really fast. And that overall, she kind of, I mean, I wouldn't say coasted, but in the end, I do take your, I take your point though. If you only need eight attempts to win, can it really be that impressive when, when you have people that have to battle all the way to the last deadlift in order to win? Um, and, and you're going up against a like murderer's row, like, like Kaiko did for instance, or in the case of like Natalie, you know, is going up against someone who's having a pretty good day other than her last deadlift. Yeah. Um, Julia, you want to defend yourself on that to Mike gold? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, obviously when somebody has a lot of competition, it's, it's obviously impressive when they come out on top, um, you know, uh, that can't be denied, but uh, if you're in a position like Evie, who was not even in the conversation, you know, really before Sheffield, like she's, she's yeah. very new to the conversation. Yeah. And um, all of a sudden you're that dominant. Like, I mean, that, yeah. it, it would not be the most impressive single um, performance, but, you know, um, it was the most impressive single performance or one of them at, um, at Sheffield and, and she did it easily this time. So, I mean, yeah. it's it a lot of improvement. I think, you know, if she had loaded up, if she put 10 kilos more and, and pulled that third deadlift, it, it totaled, what, what would it be? 470. Um, you know, what would we be saying then? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, Obviously, it's much more exciting when people hit these big totals and when people have to go into battles. But um, in terms of being impressive um, as a performance, I think that there are um, a lot of different factors that go into evaluating that. Um, and so for me, I can see why um, somebody might not um, Think that that performance was impressive but I, I to me total isn't the only thing battles aren't the only thing it's it's the whole context and and the history of um how that lifter has performed yeah and it is impressive that she could cut to 52 stay 52 for that long and not lose any strength arguably have a better performance where everything looks easier sort of like rpe prs um that she had on the platform um, you know, so definitely cool, definitely impressive for sure. So, I mean, Mike, I think we're, okay. you're outvoted let, here, brother. Sorry. Let me just clarify okay. <laughs> before we move on, just to make sure if somebody's listening to this, they don't get the wrong impression. No, it's okay. I think she had a great performance. I think it was impressive. I think anybody who wins a world championship is impressive, but let's just say like there's 16 weight classes. So let's just say among the 16 like winners, so all of them had impressive performances, but there's yeah. levels. I'm just, I'm not saying it wasn't impressive. I'm not taking yeah, away from the win, right? Definitely. And also part uh, what uh, Julia was saying is right. Meaning, for example, if Sheffield hadn't happened and this had, and she had done this meet and there was no, and she, context is important. If that hadn't happened, I wouldn't be out here saying, I don't, I would be, out, yeah. I would be agreeing. It's one of the most, but since Sheffield already did happen and we already saw this total, that's why, I, although I think it was a very good performance, I just wouldn't put it as like, my most impressive performance. No, it's cool. It's good to have a little and, argument around it. 
and okay, um fine. and it's not an american lifter so we don't we don't have to like argue like about the american lifters but we can argue about the overseas lifters it's awesome i do um, have to say one more thing though um go ahead. people were talking about like overhyping overhyping travel and what, whatnot and I, I i think that's like not a great take to say that, that travel doesn't come to people. but you know what is like undisputed in terms of affecting people is staying at like I don't know what body fat she is like 12% like she has veins everywhere and still being able to like to lift the way she does I mean you know people people who are um you know pushed really to the edge to stay in their weight class and still perform well is something that's impressive to me mm -hmm. because I can tell you right now I've been in weight classes that I I was I was too big for and it it has never gone well it has never been an eye day. so yeah. yeah it is it is I I do think like that's an aspect that adds to the impressiveness of her performance for sure and then I mean you mentioned travel she's got the farthest to travel of anyone so I mean a uh, heck of a day made it look easy with all the crazy travel with being a, a super low uh body weight and everything like this for an extended period of time like it's pretty amazing like she's she's definitely an awesome awesome person but also i get your points over here mike we're talking about the most impressive lifter the lifter that impressed you the most like so okay not the most impressive still maybe top 10 right top five for you all right so all right let's go then mike to your top choice for the most impressive lifter so my choice for the most impressive lifter is somebody that I think meets both of the criteria I was thinking. Um, she won, she shattered world records. And number two is it was something that was unexpected to most. Uh, so Brittany Schlater, um, she came in with a um, 662 nominated total, and that was good enough for her second on nominations, but um, she wasn't one of the two lifters in, in the uh, 84 pluses that were getting most of the uh, hype. And um, I had seen her lifting, but not much because she doesn't really post. So I was basing it most off just what she did at nationals. And I thought she had more in the tank, which is why I expected um, a big day. But um, even I didn't expect this kind of day. She totaled 693.5. She shattered the world record. She put up a 281 kilo squat, which isn't the world record now because it got pushed even after, but that is heavier than the world record was coming in, which was a 21 kilo squat PR from like a few months ago. She had a 155 bench, a 257 and a half, that PR'd everything. Um, took down one of the best um, competitions between weight classes, like Definitely the best ever in the 84 pluses, like, yeah. by, but like in general, one of the best like weight class battles that we've seen. Uh, it's not, it's not often that you, you see close battles in the world. You're going to see it a lot, but a lot of times close battles, like we saw in the 74s, we saw in other classes, the 74s had three people within half a kilo, but they were, they were 13 kilos below the world record. Like you see it in weight classes that you have close battles, but it's not often that you see like good battles. And we're talking about battles that are 10 plus kilos above the world record. Multiple yeah. lifts, like just putting up. So um, hitting like a 30 kilo total PR, shattering the world record in the 84 pluses, meaning the heaviest total ever by a female. Um, 281 squad, just everything to me. That was the most impressive performance in this competition. Yeah, it's tough to argue with that. I think like doing it with the GOAT there, um, going against the 11-time world champion, Bonica Brown, applying so much pressure that, you know, in the end, Bonica ends up not being able to get a deadlift in. They all get turned down and ends up bombing out on deadlift, which like we never saw that coming. We, I mean, you think an equipped sometimes like bomb outs happen a lot more frequently and she's an equipped lifter. I don't, I think she was saying afterwards that she's never bombed out before in anything, uh, equipped or otherwise. So I don't know if that's the case. I didn't check her open power lifting on that, but like that just tells you like Brittany Schlater put so much pressure that team USA and Bonica felt like they had to raise her deadlift opener and then she ended up not getting a deadlift in. So like, that's what we talked before about like, why is it different when you're at worlds and the standards are super strict, but also when you're going against these other like world's best competitors, 
it's different. The pressure is different. Whenever you have someone like uh, Brittany and Sonita like coming up and, and you can see that they're having themselves a day, it adds a lot of pressure into the, and, and, you know, hats off to Brittany Schlater. She put up an amazing performance. I think just the amount of kilos that she added to the world record is also just, just like staggering. Like I've never seen anything like that before. So that's amazing. Uh, Julia, you got any takes on that? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that was, you know, obviously one of the most impressive performances. I don't think anyone had her winning um, and she came in and did her thing. Um, I think that, you know, that really shows that just, and I'm not saying that, that any other lifters are, are overhyped necessarily, but I, I do think that in um, the powerlifting community where everything is on social media, um, some lifters tend to get a lot more attention than others. Um, and sometimes that translates into people thinking that they are far above the rest of their class. Um, and, you know, in, in reality, um, she's, she was the strongest one on the day. Um, and, you know, I think that that's, that's something that's worth paying attention to and not just, you know, maybe glossing over people because we haven't heard a lot about them or we mm -hmm. don't hear a lot about them. Um, I think that that's, that's a mistake. Um, my thing here is um, that obviously her, her performance was super impressive, um, more impressive, like impressive what she added to her total, impressive what she added to the world record total. Um, I just kind of want to stay away from weight classes where there was a lot of um, activity by the, the jury um, and stuff like that, because I think that it can get really, really messy um, in terms of um, saying what could have happened, what would have happened, all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's not to take anything away from her performance. It's, it's just that when there is so much, uh, like so many overturning of lifts, um, controversial bomb outs, all this kind of stuff, it, it makes it hard to really assess the situation accurately in terms of where people's strengths were at and, and that kind of thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's true too. I mean, but good points there. Like as far as like, I think as far as I think it's a super impressive performance and I think you made a good case for that as well, Julia and Mike, you got anything final thoughts on this or you want to move on to Julia's next pick? <laughs> uh, we probably should move on, but I always say what I want to oh. say. So, Oh, hold on. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I got one more thing for this too. I just like, I uh, kind of disagree with that last statement before. Um, in fact, this makes it all the more impressive in a class where things were getting overturned, things were getting, there were calls, this, that, just getting white lights on everything and just making it clear to the standard just shows that no matter how hard the judging was to shatter the world record with the utmost, like the no, the no deniability on the lifts, yeah. three white lights on everything, no chance for it to get protested, no chance for it to get overturned. To me, that just makes it all the more impressive. Yeah. But I mean, that, that, that was, actually is true. Like we have like clear evidence. The jury was active that that session and they couldn't touch her. It's kind of yeah. like the same thing with Kaiko's performance where like the jury was doing stuff, but they weren't doing it to Kaiko because his stuff, his, his lifts we'll were get undeniable. To, we'll get to that one soon. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get to that one. But um, I also want to just mention, like, I got to give Mike Gold credit here on the pregame show before this session, he was singing Brittany Slater's praises. Like he was saying that she could come out of nowhere. I mean, Julia, you mentioned like a lot of people don't know about her. It's, it's, which is crazy to me because like, she's a world champion. Like she won um what year was it like 2020 world championships or 2021 was it yeah. yeah yeah she won the 2021 world championships the second one in sweden and yeah i mean just everyone should have known her she was so nice too like i talked to her before i talked to her after she's like one of the nicest people in the sport it was it was really cool to see her win and um to, you know to like i said do it because the whole the whole knock on her previous world title was that she did it a year when Bonica wasn't there because Bonica wasn't able to get on team USVI and go to that world championships. So 
here kind of like Evie, uh, like, like you were saying, like she kind of like put the, you know, shut everyone up that was talking about, um, whether she could do it with Bonica there or not, just like how Evie, you know, same thing. Like there was all these questions, could she do it again? And so that does make it a little bit more impressive when it's like, Oh, there's all this talk and there's all this stuff. And then let me go nine for nine and be undeniable and do smash the world record, smash my PRs. Yeah. It was a hell of a performance by Brittany Slater hats off to her for sure. All right. Um, Let's get your next pick. Julia, again, you're up next. We do like a snake order thing here. So um, go ahead. So you have, enough, you have your one, other one ready to go? Yeah. And um, unfortunately, this one is not from uh, Team USA either. But um, you guys are killing me. This is a Powerlifting America podcast. We're supposed to be doing nothing but talking good about Powerlifting America athletes. This is, this is ridiculous. But okay, go ahead. Yeah, but I mean, this one can't be denied, um, and it's Anatoly in the 105s. Um, Mike, Mike takes a swig of straight vodka. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, you know, people were saying this is going to be a tight race, but they're also saying he's going to be back. Um, you know, maybe Emil, maybe Mikey um, could, you know, sneak in there and, and, and challenge him and I mean, he put up 940. So, I mean, that's crazy. He he also, um, and I don't know, Mike, you might want to check me on this, but I believe he he was so confident um, in his ability to, to win that he didn't even chip his own world record on squat. Um, and he just yeah. tied it. So, uh, I mean, I think that that, that speaks volumes. Um, he's just That's... he's just so far ahead of of everybody in the 105s. Like they didn't even know how far they were behind. It kind of reminds That's me a flex. of when, yeah. It reminds me of when Taylor totaled 838 and was like, "You guys don't even know." It's that that's that's the kind of performance this was. So yeah, I mean, hundred percent. There was question. We we were trying desperately to to hype that Michael Davis was going to come in here. And, and win this thing but man oh man did anatoly have other plans for the world and he had no he showed really no signs of um getting any weaker you know throughout throughout all the trials and tribulations that he's been through obviously he didn't have as great of a performance where was it at euros or something but or or at his nationals or i forget what which was euros, back euros. in the fall but man again put anyone if anyone was talking they're not talking now all they're doing is singing his praises go ahead mike so um, I agree. I think that was probably the most impressive male performance. But uh, to make Paul happy, um, since um, we picked a non-American, I'm just going to point out that was an insane performance. But um, next year in the 105s, 940 is not doing it. It might have been the most impressive performance by any male lifter at Worlds this year. But next year, 940 is not winning. So uh and why do you say that? Why do you say that? You want to give us a little sneak hint preview? I mean, we will uh, likely be having some lifters with uh, USA across their chest in the 105s mm -hmm. that um, will be putting up more than 940. That's that's all we're going to say about it. That's all I'm going to say. A little teaser right there. All right. I love it. Bring it back to Power Thing America, baby. Let's go. All right. Julia, do you, any final thoughts on that? Or I think it's pretty much uncontroversial. It's un debatable it's undisputable anatoly that was an amazing performance for sure i mean i guess mike gold if you want to be a hater you can was this his biggest performance ever i think he matched what he did at uh ukrainian nationals oh so no big deal then right mike like based on your ev logic he shattered <laughs> I'm, just record. I'm just joking yeah yeah no he he, he killed it so um i think it's wait, wait, wait. i want to i want to hear more about um and maybe he maybe he's been sworn to secrecy but but I want to hear more about uh, these these people who are. You, you know what I'm talking about. Let's yeah. we'll move on. Every, yeah, let's everyone, let them. Let everyone them. knows what I'm talking about. So anyway, let, you know, let let the lifters get their shine on when they they make their announcements. All right, um, Mike, let's move it on over to you. Then who's who's the next so, most impressive lifter for you? Moving on, uh, you were just saying something about undeniable. So. I'm going to go with uh, Mr. Undeniable, Mr. Perfect. I know he doesn't like to be called that, but uh, Mr. Jonathan Keiko. Um, just for perspective, uh, I was looking through some numbers. In his last eight meets, right, so 72 attempts, he's missed two attempts, 
two out of 72. Jeez. He meet, misses a lift on average once every four meets. The Jeez. man does not miss. Um, and wow. he's one of the rare lifters who um, he is a obviously not a bench specialist since he is ridiculously strong at everything. But he's one of the few that is able to take a huge advantage at a bench. He uh, outbenches, obviously, everybody in his weight class, uh, seeing that he just keeps pushing his world record. But he's well ahead of most of the other people that are close with him in competition, which is a big advantage, but also means that he's not like the big deadlifter. So in a lot of weight classes, I would say more often than not, the the uh, strongest lifter is the biggest deadlifter, which is the biggest technical advantage. Um, if you're able to break the record, that world record, that means you always have the chip. And even if not, you know exactly what to load on the bar. But he's he's not that guy. He just he squats. He doesn't have the biggest squat in in his uh, weight class. In fact, he has probably the one of the like the the smallest squats of the top competitors. But he goes he goes three for three on squats every time. Basically, he's missed one squat in eight. He, he, finished, last... he finished eighth on squat, by the way. So just right. put that in perspective, eight out of eight people in this session, right? Um, well, right. But he didn't finish eighth in the prime time because some he finished okay, yeah. ahead of something. Yeah. yeah but either yeah, way, I mean... so he just, he hits. That's what he does. So he goes three for three on squats always. Then he benches a world record um, and takes a lead into that lifts usually. Like he makes up on bench for what he fell behind in squat. And then on deadlift, like he doesn't have the ability to load the bar last necessarily and just hope for the win, but he just loads the bar with like top end and just hits. Man doesn't miss. So to me, it's just most impressive. He broke his own world record already at Sheffield, um, came second overall. Sheffield had a great performance. And then he comes back here, PRs again, uh, breaks his bench world record again, um, breaks his total world record, totals 888. Um, for the man who is in battles er for the last three, four years, every single time he wins usually, but he never has it easy. He's always battling with somebody to the last pull winning by a kilo, this, that, this is the first time recently that he had a, he pulled not last and it was already over. He won, like he won yeah. by 13 kilos, which is not a ton. There are some weight classes, obviously that there's going to be dominance, but this is a weight, a weight class that has a lot of strong lifters, but not just a lot of strong lifters, a lot of strong lifters who are like really close in total, like coming in, we had four lifters nominated, right? Like grouped right together. So, but when you have the guy, the one of the four who is undeniable, not just in terms of making attempts, like being smart with selection, but he lifts the standard, his squats are all to depth, his bench, there's not no issues with it. his depth, no issues with it. So tough judging, whatever, he doesn't care. He hits his lifts and he, forces anyone else to like, if you want to somehow win, you're just going to have to do something insane. And it's possible. It's always possible. There are all these top competitors in the class are capable of doing something like that, but it's going to be very hard to go for somebody to beat him. They have to go nine for nine and, and nine for nine while pushing really hard. Yeah. And it's very difficult to do. And bottom line is it doesn't usually get done. So to me, just seeing him go again, nine for nine, push the world record, uh, win semi-handedly in like one of the closest uh, weight classes. To me, that was just extremely impressive. Yeah, this was going to be my other pick as well. Like this, like just Mr. Undeniable. And like we said, it's all the more impressive that he did it in a time, like in the in the part of the week where I feel like the jury was like a little more unpredictable. Obviously the very last session, it was also pretty active, but um, it was it was active in this session. And yeah, he's just, I, I mean, winning by 13 kilos in this weight class, is like astonishing like that is an ass kicking that this weight class usually doesn't get like you don't see people win the 93s by 13 kilos so it just goes to show like he had himself a day i think the turnaround from sheffield and being able to break the world record at sheffield which i believe he did right and then he broke it again here so i mean it's just like to break the world total world record twice in such a short span of time add on to your, you know, uh, PRs and whatnot on the platform, like, or, you know, and then like go nine for nine, like Mr. Undeniable. It's a spectacular performance. It's like one of the best, greatest performances, I think of all time, you know? Um, so the only thing that makes it more impressive to me, like in my, my case, Natalie Richards performance is that it was her first time at the world championships. Like it, and so like, you just don't see people going nine for nine and PRing all the stuff that she did, um, at the world championships 
Keiko, on the other hand, like we're in the Keiko era. Like I think we've been in the Keiko era for a minute now. And um, even though like, it's crazy that you can lose a world championship and people still think like we're in the Keiko era, you know, um, and even coming into this. So uh, yeah, definitely one of the greatest performances of uh, Julia. What, what do you think about Jonathan Keiko? Yeah. I mean, he, he's just, um, you know, he's, he's something else. Like people talk a lot about, you know, how powerlifting is, is 90% mental um, and, and all that, you know, they, they say things like that. And sometimes it's people just, you know, saying things they heard, but I think that he really proves it. I mean, he, his ability to keep his composure in high pressure situations and perform at his best, I think at this point, I would say is unparalleled, um, at least in powerlifting. Um, and I think that, you know, and obviously like I haven't competed at that level, but I would assume that anyone who underrates him probably hasn't either because um, it's just, it's different than, you know, going yeah. nine for nine in local meets. And I'm not saying, you know, going nine for nine in local meets is not impressive, don't get me wrong. But, you know, going nine for nine at Mega Nationals, going nine for nine at the Arnold, going nine for nine at the at Worlds, these are different, this is a different thing. And to do it repeatedly or go, you know, or eight for nine or, and just keep dominating, especially with the extenuating circumstances he's had. Um, travel wise, I think in uh, 2021, we all heard about that um, for yeah. nationals. Yeah. Um, you know, he, his ability to, to just be able to perform at a top level, no matter what is something I, I don't see in, in hardly, you know, maybe a few other lifters, but certainly not to the extent yet that Keiko has shown. So. Definitely. And if you ever, I mean, I don't think you need to compete at the world championships. Like if you just have two eyeballs in your head, you can look at his performances and look at his open power thing and just look at his performance at these world championships. If this was the only competition you've seen, this was still like you, you saw what the jury was doing all week. Like this, this was spectacular performance. Um, and couldn't happen to a nicer guy, you know, like just like one of the sweetest guys, one of the, um, I think just the gentlest and, you know, just the kindest people in the sport. So, and shout out also to Nina, um, his teammate out there. Like she's, she's like doing so much stuff in the warm up room. Like she was following him out into the tunnel, putting chalk on his back. Like as he's walking, like they have everything down to a science. She had like a bunch of food for him and all kinds of stuff. Like she did, she did a fantastic job with him as well. The whole team um, uh, handling him because he was handled by Mike Z and he was handled by, um, you know, Rodney Elm and Tamara Lopes, uh, the, the, all of the U S national team head coaches and, um, and Nina back there. And that was that. And then like Joey out front watching from the crowd, it was, it was an amazing performance. So definitely really cool and, um, excited. He was, he was in best. He want, he was ahead for best lifter for like after his performance for until the one Oh fives came and, uh, Anatoly knocked him off and just pointed up. Anatoly's performance was a 116.575 and Kaiko's was a 116.230. So like this close, man. Like, I feel like that's why Anatoly loaded what he did in the end was to just go for best lifter. And then there's a pretty, I mean, a little bit of a gap down to uh, Gustav in third, um, which if that tells you anything on the, you know, the next best lifter is the guy that came in second place to Kaiko 13 kilos back. And it's a 114 good lift score, 114.679. So pretty cool, pretty great performance uh, from Kaiko. And hats off to him. He's an amazing guy. And we couldn't be happier or prouder of him. So no arguments from anyone here. Um, all right. So I'll, Mike, unless you got anything else to say, anything else come to mind? Okay. I'll go on with my last pick. And like I said, I mean, those were my two favorites, Natalie and, and Jonathan. No, no, no big surprise. They were the highest ranked best lifters for Team USA. Um, and then I'm going to go with the next best, uh, lifter, which she finished third on the women's side and best lifter with, uh, 120 good lift points, a pretty amazing score there. And that's Amanda Lawrence, uh, the four time world champion. Just again, you want to talk about like, we're in the Amanda Lawrence era. Um, it's her world. We're living in it. Um, she's the queen. She had a two and a half kilo 
squat world record, broke it by two and a half kilos, which she had already just broke the world record two times, like 12 months before this Mike in the post game press conference, like beautifully pointed this out. Like, what does it feel like to break the squat world record, you know, three times in a matter of 12 weeks. Like that's one of the most insane things I've ever heard. Um, and then she won by 70 kilos. Like, I just feel like it's, how can you say it's like not the most impressive, one of the most impressive performances of the competition. We win your class by 70 kilos. You break the world record. You're pushing. She pulled for the, for the best lifter on deadlift would have been amazing if she had got that. But, um, as she mentioned in her post competition press conference, she had an adductor injury, um, leading into this and wasn't able to go super heavy on deadlift. So she was just happy that she was able to load it and, you know, almost lock it out, get it up and everything like that. And she just kept saying in her post game press conference, like she's going to put a dangerous package together for Sheffield. So she's super fired up. And I think that's one of the most impressive things for me is like, you know, you see other lifters, like you say, like, we'll go out. They won't necessarily take their last lifts or like play it smart, play it cool. Don't really push. That's not Amanda. Like she pushes, like she wants to break her own squat world record again for the third time. Um, she wants to push her bench and only because she was, you know, having some issues with her left shoulder. Did she not try to go for a bench PR and get over that one thirty hump? Um, and of course she loaded for the win in the end, like just pulling like a, a, what was it like a half a kilo or a kilo below the world record deadlift that she pulled at Sheffield again, 12 weeks prior. I mean, I just think the turnaround from Sheffield, how great of a performance is the fact that there's like nothing on the line for her here. She can win with openers as Mike gold mentioned on our pregame uh, show when we talked about this. So I think it's just, um, it, you know, a testament to one of the greatest athletes we've ever seen in the sport. And I think anytime she shows up and tries hard, it's one of the most impressive things that you'll ever get a chance to see. So I, I really, um, I really hats off to Amanda Lawrence. I just think like she's an, uh, such an impressive competitor. So yeah. What do you think about that take Mike? We'll go to you first. So, yeah, I mean, I fully agree with everything. It's just, it's so difficult to be in a class where there's nobody pushing you. And it's so, what's so it's, I mean, it's very impressive to be in a class where nobody's pushing you yet. You just continue to put up like all time performances, obviously like it's, not possible to break the world record every meet just practically like the world record would be a million kilos but just putting up like performances like on the brink of the world record or breaking the world record every time um pring squat for another world record uh pulling for best lifter just like it's crazy i mean like you said like there are classes there are classes that are much closer than this where you see people taking it easy because uh, they don't want to push it for Sheffield or whatever it is. They want to do whatever reasons they don't need to go. She just puts it all out there, like on the table every time. Um, and it's just, yeah. I mean, we are in the Amanda era and we will be in the Amanda era until she decides that she has something else she wants to do because there's nobody close and there's nobody that's like, like, honestly, there's people like improving, but there's nobody on the come up that there's nobody that, looks like they'll be within 40 kilos anytime soon, which yeah. is, I mean, it's one of the only, there's only two weight classes like this. So it's, it's, uh, it's tough, but it's crazy. Yeah. And of course, what's the other one? Let's give a honorable mention here to another pretty impressive guy. So Jesus, obviously, um, yeah. I mean, the man just came off of Sheffield came off the most impressive historic performance in the history of powerlifting, I don't even think there's an argument for anything else, to be honest. Um, I don't care what formula you use. I don't care what metric you use. Um, the metric that's the number one metric is um, kilos. And to break the world record by uh, uh, 50 kilos or whatever it was, I mean, that was the best performance ever. Yeah. But and uh, he so went, he came he off his weight and class he, easy. yeah, so he's the other person that coached, but even him. Like, obviously, we saw he didn't end up going for the squad world record. It wasn't necessarily the best day. He had just come off a couple months off Sheffield. Uh, the flights were moving fast. But still, like, he could have taken it easy. He could have won on openers easily. And he still squatted 1,000 pounds just for just for the crowd, the people that are here to see him. So, yeah. Also, that was also. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So, what do you think, Julia? Back to Amanda, um, the topic at hand. But nice side note, because I did want to give, I mean, Jesus is, anytime the man is in the building, it's impressive. So go ahead, Julia. What do you think about the Amanda pick? Yeah, I like it. Um, I think that 
we have to mention though that we left um Corolla off this list and um and I wouldn't necessarily put her above Amanda but what I will say is that all three ladies who are in the top three um, for good lift points um, totaled above uh, 120 good lift points. Wow. I mean, that's staggering. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, you know, what makes uh, Amanda so impressive to me um, and why I think I, why I agree with your choice um, is because you know, the formulas and, and dots is, you know, probably better. Good lift points is probably better than what's been used in the past, but generally um, lifters in the higher weight classes uh, don't, don't get to the same um, coefficient points as lifters in the lower weight classes. And she just does it continually. Like mm -hmm. every, every single year she's in the running for the best lifter. Um, and even when she doesn't have her best performance, it's um, it's almost like she is a victim of her own success when it comes to uh, well, I mean, she was at the Sheffield, you obviously, know, but, big time at Sheffield. But also in terms of hype, when um, like people don't even talk about her as much because she's so dominant. There's nothing to talk about. I mean, there is yeah. just you know. Um, you know, what is there to say? She's going to dominate the 84s for until she retires, it looks like, um, or, yeah. you know, moves to the class. I mean, so there's just nothing to say. Um, and so for that reason, I think she is the correct pick. Um, but I feel, I just feel very bad for leaving Corolla off the list because um, she broke a world record that, let's face it, people thought would never fall. Um, with Leah's, with Leah's uh, 63 uh, kilo so, world record. Are you second guessing your Evie pick now? Do you want to go back and pick a roll? Well, you mentioned that you were going to pick Evie no, or Corolla for your first pick. You did I, mention her. I did, I did mention that. Um, but no, no, no. I think that this is a fitting list. And I think um, Corolla deserves the honorable mention. I just think it would be um, like we'd be leaving something out to not give the honorable mention. Because we did, right. we did. Well, okay, well, I don't want to cut you off, but we're talking about Amanda Lawrence here, all right? So don't try and be bringing up these lifters from other countries. Um, let's get back to the subject at hand here, which is, I'm just looking because I think I think people think dots is kind of like a better metric overall. Uh, I don't know. IP have good the points. Amanda finished third, and if we just look at dots as well, um, this performance that she put up. Um, looking at her dots, it would have been a, it was a 586, which if we look at all time best, that would, that's the fifth best performance all time. Um, and that's again with her, like basically somewhat YOLOing her, her deadlift, um, you know, like not being able to train deadlift heavy very much and just like going out there and trying to basically pull the world record deadlift. Um, and then also just on this list too, I want to mention that Natalie Richards performance at in Malta was a 595.46 dots fourth best all time. Um, so pretty cool performances that we have here from these two ladies from team USA. Yeah. And I think, I mean, Amanda's performance at Sheffield would be third, right? Amanda's performance was a third best of all time on dots. Yes. Barely, barely, um, like just a, a couple tenths ahead of Natalie's performance here. So that's going to be cool. Cause you know, Natalie, you know, uh, so Amanda, <laughs> I'll say this because she, she came up to me and she's like, uh, yeah, she was, she's like, yeah. Um, someone at this competition, like, uh, intentionally went out and beat my like best good lift score ever or something like this. I think that's what it was. What she saying? Were you there, Mike? When she was saying, and she was like salty about it. She's like, "Yeah, someone, someone beat my 
best good lift scorer. And I just, I took that personally. Like she was, <laughs> she didn't say that exactly, but she had that look on her face. Like, like she was taking it personally. And we're like, no, it was Natalie. It wasn't anyone going after you, Amanda. Don't worry. Like no one was going after your good lift score, Amanda. Don't, don't worry about it. It's like, that's what she had to have in order to win. She was just having a nine for nine day. And she had more in the tank if she wanted to specifically like, you know, go after your good lift points or whatever. And she's like, oh, okay. Is it was, since it was Natalie. Okay. That's fine. I won't take that personally. <laughs> then it was, it was just so funny to see, like she gets fired up about this stuff it's so cool um and she's such a cool person such a great competitor um just being around here she's like she's just like a a ball of energy like too like she's like super hyped up and she gets super hyped up but then she's also super fun and nice and and chatty and everything like that so it's just it's, it couldn't happen to a better person um other than you know like she said giving her an opportunity now she has an off season she's going to come back put together a dangerous package for sheffield she's fired up i mean i just who knows what we're going to see she what'd she say mike she's going to pull 600 right she she still got the chance to be the first one so yeah yeah so she might still be the first one so that's going down um she's probably going to break her squat world record again she's going to get a bench pr oh i mean i didn't even mention she she won the gold medal in all four disciplines which was yeah. cool she she bragged about that in the press conference that was like hey she got a bench gold you know it's not really her event but it's cool and she said she's trying mike she's going to get her she's going to get her bench up so yeah. she's the only lifter in the competition to uh to get all four gold medals see that's impressive all right that's that's why she's on the most impressive list all right um so let's move on to the next topic here we're really dragging this out <laughs> this, this the world championships happened a month ago but we're we're loving it so much we're still going over it um all right what lifter do you think even after the world championships is still being slept on like they're they're still being slept on despite their great performance at the world championships and mike you can go first so i'm going to make this quick because we got to move on and we're going to yeah. discuss this lift there very soon either way but my answer to this would be uh wasker um in general i think the weight class the 59s are not really a talk about weight class and i understand why um it's not a weight class that has been competitive in a while the only person in that weight class who have been putting up pretty big numbers is somebody who's failed the drug test and is not here right now either way. But um, Wasker, I wouldn't say came out of nowhere because like the Americans knew, but um, he, it's his first international competition. He, um, people didn't even think he was going to make it to Worlds because he had to hit uh, the Carpino one just to make the Worlds team. And a lot of people thought he wasn't going to hit that. That in itself was already a nice PR total for him. A couple months ago then he came here and um it looked like it was his weight class to win that and it was but there was a little there was an additional goal which is to qualify for sheffield he went eight for eight going into his last pull he loaded it up he couldn't hit it but he still hit a very nice total which would be the third highest total ever in the 59s and he could easily hit the second heaviest total ever if he wanted to go for that, which obviously wasn't a priority, but I think just people aren't talking about him so much because partially because it's not a super competitive weight class, partially because the overall total amount of kilos is not as heavy as in certain other weight classes, maybe because there isn't the specific superstar that's well known yet, whatever reasons they are, I think he's still getting slept on. And I think that in the future, we're going to see him hopefully be to the 59s, what Pano was to the 66s. I think he'll be known globally. I think he's going to push his total much further into the 600s. Um, hopefully, at some point in the future, the uh, world record total in the 59s will be held by somebody who's clean. Uh, it might take some time since it's it's a pretty heavy world record total, but I think he's yeah. still getting slept on a little bit, and I think he's going to continue to improve and hopefully he's going to bring a little bit of light back to the 59s. You're hundred percent. Right. Like I think it's, he, he won, um, he had an amazing performance. He, he like, also, if you want to just factor in like great performances, first time at the world championships and just smashes it, like has an eight for eight day goes pulls for the Sheffield almost gets it. Like could have just fixed his grip a little and he would have had it and he'd be going to Sheffield and that'd be amazing for a 59 kilo lifter to be at Sheffield. So Hopefully, um, I'm thinking, you know, did he get within 95%? Is there any chance that he can get invited to Sheffield? 
Um, I think he's no, that was what he needed was that 95% chance. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Damn. So I mean, who knows? Um, probably gonna be a tough road because there's so many people that came that did do the 95%. So, but, um, hopefully he gets a shine on that Sheffield stage. I'm sure he will one day, like you said, like he's that guy, he's going to come around and he's kind of, again, like it, he made it look so easy. I feel like that's maybe why people aren't talking about it. He doesn't have a battle. Um, it would happen in the very first day, like before the opening ceremony even happened, they did the 50, they just like got the 59s over with. And so maybe just people are forgetting about it because there were so many other amazing performances and like battles and things like that, that came afterwards. But um, you haven't heard the last of, last of Waskar. If you haven't already, listen to the King of Lifts interview with him. You know, you get a backstory that you've never heard about him before. And um, I think maybe if we people can just kind of start to get to know who, who he is as a guy a little bit more, then he'll get a little bit more hype and a little more shine. Uh, Julia, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think um, this is going to be a little spicy. I think, uh, you know, maybe we should continue to... Um, underestimate and underrate Wasker because it seems like he loves proving people wrong um and he thrives he thrives when um in that like you know you don't believe I can do it but I know I can so yeah if, if I have any word of advice to anybody keep underestimating him um and he will for sure break that world record I mean, he told me, cause actually the first podcast he ever went on was the power of the America podcast. He was actually the first guest on this very podcast. Um, so shout out Waskar for that. But he actually told me on that episode that when King of the lifts had like their, uh, preview show, I think, and they were talking about like the qualifying totals, they were like, I don't think any 59s can hit it. And he said, he took that personally. I think those were his exact words. He's like, I took that personally. He's like, he's like, I can't wait to eventually like be like, what's up to these guys whenever I see them. And, uh, I don't know. I have to go back and listen to him. I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering the quote that he actually gave, but he basically was like, I remember that. And I had that in my mind and I was going to prove them wrong. You're exactly right. So yeah, Waskar, I think we are entering the Waskar era for sure. I mean, he's just that good. He's that guy. And he's such a nice guy. Again, you know, his wife, and his uh, child are out there in the front front row. I mean, it's just it's just beautiful, and um, like the his whole backstory and everything like that. And he's like, he's a good guy. He's like, works hard, trains hard, does everything on point. Like, doesn't even barely. He had like a Chick fil A sandwich at in Austin after um, after winning. Like, he didn't even like go out and drink or do anything like this. So it's like he's he's just a really good guy. And he's opening a gym. He's gonna be running meets. So he's gonna be in the sport for a while. So happy for him he needs he needs definitely to get more love like yeah i can't believe his follower count is like it's pretty low it's like three four thousand or something like we got to blow him up he needs to be like over twenty thousand. like he's a star so so all right so julia that's your job um promote the hell out of wascar let's get him 20k all right uh julia who's who's your pick for a lifter that's being slept on okay well so i made um this choice uh a week ago and so I want to kind of change it because um, my original pick was Corolla, um, but she has been interviewed by King of the Lifts. And I think that things have changed a little bit since then. But the lifter who I think will continue to be slept on because of the circumstances in which she won um, is Brittany Schlater because um, Bonica bombed out. Bonica wasn't there the last time she won. Bonica bombed out this time. And yes, it was a good competition and all of that. But um, I think that just the circumstances of her victory um, will make it that way. I think um, it is probably not going to be appreciated as much as classes where there is constant hype and constant attention on the weight class. Um, and I think that that is one of the things that I dislike most about powerlifting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I think Brittany Schlater is is extremely underrated, um, and I don't think she's going anywhere. Um, I think she's just going to get better. Um, and I I know there are people that are coming over who are very strong who can challenge her as well. Um, and I don't really want to to get into that we can leave that but um Easy. i think you know <laughs> but i think that um you know this class is now an exciting one and she's at the top of it and um to 
make that happen in essentially one competition is uh, pretty remarkable. Um, but yeah, I, I just don't think the super heavyweight women get the the um, attention they deserve all the time. There it is, right there. Like I don't think the super heavyweight women get the attention that they deserve. Like like should this performance, like given how spectacular a performance it was, given that she did it on the big stage with everyone, with all the competition, the most competition ever in the weight class. Um, and just shattered the world record like she did everything like you're right like I don't think that if she didn't gain like 50,000 followers um, in the week after then she's being slept on in my opinion like that's what she deserves but you're right super heavies don't get that kind of love Mike any thoughts on that um, I, mean, I I do agree she's definitely slept on I mean she was slept on coming in I think part of it is just I don't know if it's so much a matter of not appreciating her performance. Like in certain weight classes, sometimes like like I like Waskar would say, like people didn't appreciate his performance as much. I think here it's a little more of just a matter of like this part of the same reason she was slept on coming in is just she's not big into social media. So yeah, um, like it or not, powerlifting now is a social media sport. I don't mean that you have to be hitting PRs on social media. You shouldn't be doing that. You should be saving for competition. But what I do mean is that most of the lifters that people know and people follow and people root for and people hype up are the ones who, whether or not they're posting PRs, they're constantly posting on social media. They're, they're posting their lifts. They're interacting with people. So people know them. I mean, the biggest superstars in our sport, uh, Ross, Jessica, people like that. I mean, there's many others, but they have big social media followers followers but they're on social media they're posting they're interacting so people get people get to not only see their lifts but they get to feel like they know the person yeah when someone's very not active on social media they could be the strongest in the world in this case right like literally the strongest total ever by um a woman but if if people don't don't see them like yeah so if you watch the world championships you should have seen her now and should now she should purely be on everyone's radar, every single person. Yeah. But a lot of people don't necessarily watch, or if they watch, they watch part of it. They watch for specific lifters, they whatever it is. So if they don't see this person around in general, they just don't get their full appreciation. So I definitely agree that she is still slept on and that um, she deserves more appreciation. Um, yeah, you talk about social media. That's really the only media that we have is social media. That's why it's so important. Like if you're on social media or not, like you're not getting covered by ESPN, you know, you're not getting covered by these. Not yet. So not yet. Um, we're hoping and we're getting better and better, but, um, right now it's like social media is the media as far as powerlifting is concerned. So you got to get in there. All right. Yeah. No debate there. Um, so, all right, I'll give you mine who I think is being slept on and, uh, people aren't talking about her amazing performance and that's Meg Scanlon. And, um, I think like, again, it's, she, I almost had her in my list of most impressive, um, performances just because I think like she did have like a really, really spectacular performance. I think it was overshadowed by what Corolla did as, as we mentioned before. Um, but she put 27 and a half kilos on her total from South Africa at the world championships that won her the world title. Um, she still finished in second. She put up a 532.5 kilo total. I was looking back. Um, I mean, that puts her pretty high in the running. Um, for one of the best performances all time, like her 537.5 that she had is like seventh, you know, so it's like, it's, it's up there. It would be, it would be up there pretty high, like probably top 10 best performance all time. Um, and you know, um, she hit a PR on her squat. She hit a PR on her deadlift. She had a, improved her bench. Um, even despite having, uh, the new bench rule, like she improved it from the last time that she did it under the new bench rules. Um, she was also the only 63 kilo lifter to medal in all three events and took silver overall, um, you know, which contributed really important team points. So it was a clutch performance. And, uh, and then the other thing is, is that if you want to look at like weight classes um, and just compare her to other weight classes that she would have actually finished second place if she competed as a 69 with the same total um, as, as fully under 63, like she didn't, she wasn't hard for her to cut. Like she's definitely like one of the lightest, easy to make 63s um, out there. And she's putting up numbers that would get her second place in the 69s. Right. So it's like, like, that's pretty impressive 
Um, yeah, she would have tied Marta Jenner in the 69s. Um, you know, obviously one on body weight, a whole class down, a whole weight class down. Um, and she also would have taken silver on squat and gold on bench in the 69s as well. So, I mean, like the, this is a big performance. She would have finished ninth on deadlift, but still, um, pretty amazing performance. And I just think that like she gets overshadowed by Leah and she gets overshadowed by Corolla, but still like just, you know, um, uh, really, really great performance. And, and we, Mike, we talked to her afterwards at the press conference. I think you were there for that one. Yeah. And she's, she's got more in the, in the tank. Like she's, she's definitely like five thirty two and a half. Like, you know, you think someone at her age, 35 years old, wouldn't be putting on kilos like this, but she is adding a ton of kilos to her total. Like she is far from being done. Um, in the sport, like she's making gains like a freaking junior right now, like adding like t- uh, what I, what did I say? It was, it was like, uh, 27 and a half kilos in a year. And that's, that's with taking into account the fact that her bench took a huge hit on for with the bench rule. So, I mean, spectacular, great performance. Amazing. Um, she should be, everyone should be talking about this performance. And so I feel like she's being slept on Mike gold. What do you think? Um, I, I just thought it was funny. You were mentioning the 69th. I may or may not have been speaking to her this week about um, uh, a sneak attack in the, an Eevee, let's just call it. A reverse Uh, Eevee? No, no. Going to 57? So she's been there before. She's uh, battled for gold before. She's, she, granted it was without Leah, but she won, she's already won one at 63. Uh, We were talking about like what she wants to do in the sport and what she could do in the sport. And I was like, you know, um, you could always win uh, uh, world championships in three different weight classes. So I know eventually she uh, would theoretically go up to 69, even though she's still comfortable at 63. Yeah. I'm like, oh, before you do that, you can always go back one more time uh, to the 57s. I don't see it because because she wants to have fun, and it's not fun. It, it wouldn't be fun for her to try to go to 57, I don't think. I think she'd have more fun. Like, I'm, I'm thinking – Let's, I wish, I hope she gets a Sheffield invite. She's within 95% of the world record. Um, if she goes to Sheffield, she doesn't cut. If she has between now and then, however many months that is to build up, get up to like maybe 65 kilos and then just don't cut, get, be all carved up going in. And just like, I think, I mean, she's, and keep, if she keeps progressing her total, like she did, I mean, when we saw it, like she had more in the tank on the day and we know yeah, her bench, we know her bench sure. has a ton yeah. left. Her bench has a ton left. She's barely getting her bench down now. So um, I think she could be competing with Leah and and Corolla, especially if you consider she adds some more muscle, doesn't yeah. cut, comes in super carved up. Like she's a she's a gamer too. Like she'll show up on game day and do something special. So um, all right, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think she has um, a lot in the tank uh, too. I mean, I, I think that, um, yeah, like you said, she is, she is overshadowed by these European lifters, but um, she's closing the gap pretty impressively. Um, and I actually, I wanted to mention um, Chelsea Savitt too, just really quickly, because sh- her total has been going up a lot. And I think that she's been repeatedly counted out. Um, oh, yeah. And every time she performs better than people expect. And if she can just keep doing that, um, I, you know, if, if both of them can just keep doing that, um, you know, whether it's next year or the year after that, um, they're going to be, uh, you know, right up there to win these weight classes. So, yeah, yeah. Um, for sure. I mean, I mean, Chelsea Savitt was two, t- basically, you know, two and a half kilos out of second place in the 69s as well. So, yeah, I mean, like, she's I remind right there. That her, she's, she's only 17 kilos away from the world record. Like, she's, yeah. And, and that's, she missed her opening deadlift, had to like take a smaller jump. Like she's, she's not there yet, but she's, she's within striking distance. And she's fired up too. Like, have you guys been seeing her story posts and stuff this week? Like she is, she's back at her, she's back training. She was, she she even made a Reddit post, Reddit powerlifting back to life. Yeah. She's, she, she's been on threads. Like, like she is definitely like, she can see the light at the end of the, she can see that she's close to that world record and she could go get it now. Uh, I think mentally 
She's in a, like extremely strong p- place right now. Same, same thing with Meg Scanlon. Like they're both like, that's probably one of their biggest weapons right now is that they both believe that they can compete with the best in the world and beat them and go toe to toe and win. And like that's so, that when you have that belief and then, you know, two really smart, smart women here, like they're going to, they're going to put it together in the gym and get strong enough to go out there and do it. So on game day. So, all right. So yeah, definitely good, good choice there um, for uh, an honorable mention as far as being slept on. You're right. Like Chelsea's like perennially being slept on. Okay. So let's get into the actual day by day recap, what actually happened. And just from the top, you know, we've mentioned it throughout, we mentioned it on the, on the part one and everything like that. Team USA won. they swept the team points, both men and women on the men's side. It was a pretty big victory, 57 to 39 over France. And then on the women's side, it was a tie with France, 50 to 50. Great, great performances by both Team France and by Team USA there. And then Team USA had a 589.25 good lift score, whereas France had a 577.4. So that was the ultimate tiebreaker that decided in favor of Team USA. Then um, when we look at medals for best lifter, we took the gold in the women's with Natalie Richards, we talked about her performance and also the bronze with uh, Amanda Lawrence in third place there. On the men's side, we took the we took the silver uh, for Jonathan Kaiko. And then uh, we had, you know, Gavin and Delaney and Taylor all in the top 10, but none of them medaled. So we took home, you know, three best lifter medals, um, one for the best, best female. And then on the men's side, the silver medal for Kaiko. So, yeah. And then, Julia, do you want to tell us just basically – Give us a rundown on the overall medal count. So um, for the women, um, we finished with 21 medals total. 10 of them were gold, five of them were silver, and six of them were bronze. Um, For the men, we finished with 19 medals total, uh, eight gold, six silver, and five bronze. Okay, awesome. And every single American lifter at worlds got at least one medal including wow. including Cody. so yeah i actually had to double check I, I know that her world record squat didn't count but um it, it didn't count as a world record but it did count as a gold medal i checked the live stream she did in fact get a gold medal for that um also if we're just looking at total um if just looking at medals for for totals um usa won the most gold medals with six the next closest was france with three um, the most medals overall with 11, the next closest was France with six. Um, <clears throat> and then, yeah, the best lifters that I broke down before. So yeah, just, uh, I think we could say a very strong performance from team USA overall, obviously we're always looking to improve. Obviously we don't want to tie on team points. And if Bonica had meddled, uh, got on the podium, we wouldn't have tied. We would have won out. Right. But it is what it is. We got to be better. We got to be stronger next year and we got to win by more, but Still happy, great performance. Um, definitely most medals, most golds, all those things. Uh, most best lifter medals, all that kind of stuff as well. So, all right, let's get into the day-by-day recap. So first thing that we have, if we're going to start off with the top, uh, day one of the world championships started with the 59 kilo men that we mentioned before. That's our guy, Waskar. And then it goes into the 47s where we had two lifters, Jessica and Heather. And then into the 52s where we had our honorary member of Team USA, Power Team America, Evie. And so... Um, Mike, let's go ahead and uh, jump in straight into the 59s. So we'll start with the 59s. Um, the 59s was not really much of a battle. Um, we had our man, Wasker, uh, win it. Uh, he totaled 625. He pulled for Sheffield, couldn't get it, but he still won comfortably by 22 and a half kilos. Uh, coming in second was um, Ivan Diaz Campano from uh, Spain. He's a junior. He broke the uh, junior world record total with 602.5. Total, uh, a very good performance. And then we had um, veterans, uh, Franklin Leone and Antoine Garcia coming third and fourth. And then our man Ish coming in fifth. Um, Our honorary man. Our honorary man. He's (laughs) a a friend of Team uh, USA. We'll call him that. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So it wasn't wasn't, um, the most exciting weight class in terms of battling um but wasker did put up a good performance and led from wire to wire he started off uh with a decent lead on like uh, forecasted total and then just made his first eight lifts and he put the bag away his opening deadlift it was already 
over in terms of winning the gold. So a pretty straightforward weight class. We took home our first gold to start the day. And yeah. Yeah. Great performance. Julia, you want to um, add anything you want to add in the medals? Oh yeah. So uh, Waskar won two gold, one silver, one bronze. Um, and obviously uh, one of those gold medals was his overall gold medal, um, which yeah. is the most important. Um, so yeah. Uh, so real quick, he got four medals. He got he got silver on squat, gold on bench, and he got bronze on deadlift. Um, be, you know, probably that would have changed if it wasn't for that last miss. Um, but and then gold overall. So four medals, great job, great performance. Anything else you want to add to that, Julia? No, just uh, I I think uh, will he may not have made Sheffield this year, but we'll be seeing him there real soon. Yeah, just to add like a little color to the day. I mean, uh, Waskar, we're talking about him being a family man. After squat, uh, squats are over. As we know, these sessions are moving fast. And this was a very quick session as well um, because they're really like trying to seem like squeeze it in before the ceremony, opening ceremonies. But after squat, he actually went out. There's a really long distance that you had to cover to get from the warm up room to where the stands were, where, which is where his wife and his child were. And so he wanted to get out there and he, you know, wanted to see his uh, child and see his wife. And they're just like out there, you know, um, he went over and just basically said, you know, they greeted him and everything. It was just like a really wholesome moment. Like, and he was basically like, had to like run to get back, you know, and, and get onto doing his bench press and everything like that. And then again, after deadlift, same thing, like before awards, before he talked to anyone else, before he did press all that stuff, the first thing he did was like, he had to go find his family, you know? And so, so, so just goes to show like what kind of priorities that he has. He definitely could have just been chilling after squat cause it was moving fast. And we were definitely trying to hustle people like get as soon as you're done with squats, get your sleeves off and get ready to start benching, like go to the bathroom if you need to. And then let's go, you know, like, and keep like refueling. Cause you know, Waskar does, does cut and everything like that. So like keep eating and doing all that stuff. And then like, he also took the time to like do little interviews with me on the cell phone. Um, like while he was walking over there and back and stuff like that. So just a great guy. And then he stuck around and, and hung out during Natalie's session and like helped out in the warm up room and stuff with her session and was hyping her up and stuff too. So Great guy. He couldn't happen to a better guy. And we're super excited to see what the future lies for him, for sure. A Sheffield uh, appearance at some point in his future. And a World Games perform uh, appearance, for sure. Like, he's going to bring a lot of spice to the World Games. Because, I mean, I think it's a top three podium finisher. So, like, 59s, um, he'll be the one that can will be actually competing for the title, you know. Uh, because it'll be the 59s and the 66s lumped together. And so he'll be the one that can actually go head to head against like all these 66 kilo ballers that we got. All right. Um, the next session after, you know, opening ceremonies happens, then the next session is the 47s. Mike, take it away. So, so the 47s actually is one of the weight classes that we haven't discussed so much um, up to this point. Yeah. So the, in this, in this session, we had, we had our two lifters. We had Jessica Espinal and then we had former world champion, Heather Connor. Um, this was a pretty exciting session. Yeah. Um, coming into this competition, we had never had more than 147 total 400 kilos in the same meet. And here we had five. Um, wow. It was pretty crazy. Um, so we got Tiffany Chapone from France. She took home the gold. She totaled 424 and a half, a little bit under her best total, but she had a pretty good day, not the best day. But then after that, it was, it was, uh, a great performance from like the next four lifters all. So Jessica Espinal came in second. She totaled 412 and a half, um, beating her total from powerlifting American Nationals. She pulled to solidify second with a 175 kilo deadlift that she had more. Uh, she probably could have, who knows, taken another five kilos or something. But she, she looks like she has a little bit on everything. She's getting used to the new bench rules. So her bench is going back up to like its peak bench. And she's young. She is a, she's 22. I believe she's still a junior. She's pretty light for a 47, which is like hard to imagine, but she's like comfortable with weight. So she's still new and she's, she's growing. She's gaining. Um, that 424 and a half from Tiff is going to, she's probably just probably going to be approaching that next year. So at next year's point, I think we're going to have more of a battle for, for the gold, um, potentially with other competitors also, but, um, 
in general. And then after that, we had Heather who came in third. She had to load up a monstrous 200 kilo deadlift to pull for third. Um, she pulled the tie and then she won on body weight since she came in light since she's, she's pretty light 47 also. Uh, she pulled 200 kilos mass. The world record prior was 180 something. I forget exactly, but she shattered the world record. She didn't have the exact day she wanted because, um, something went, she heard something on squats and she was only able to make her third attempt. She had to retake her opener twice. And even in the third attempt, it was scary. She initially got two reds, but um, the jury overturned it to actually a good lift, which is one of the few circumstances going that way over this <laughs> the weekend. Only the only time week. that we can remember off the top of our heads. No, no. I mean, the only time for the U.S., but it happened yeah, yeah, also. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. for the U.S. Yeah. Actually, it you happened. Don't... Well, it happened to another U.S. lifter also, but whatever. Um, yeah. Well, maybe we'll discuss it later. Maybe it's not so yeah. important, but either way, so it was a scary shaky start. And then on bench, she ended up paying 75 kilos, which is also a little less than we were expecting. She had been having a very good uh, bench prep coming in, but not sure exactly what happened, but she ended up not hitting as much as she would like. She went two or three on bench. And then obviously the big deadlift to pull the third, but then we had a uh, Oriel win from um, Canada who also just came out of the juniors. She told four seven and a half which is who Heather had to pull to beat on body weight. And then Vicky from Australia, who totaled 400. I believe she is coached by, she's a perform motion uh, lifter. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and then Oriel is a, uh, is coached by Rory Lynch. So we got like all around here. We got like the strength guys, Rory Lynch. We got like, top level coaches all around. So France, Canada, USA. Right. Yeah. We got Australia, like, I mean, we Italy. got some of the biggest countries in terms of like powerlifting right now. We got some of the better coaches there. We got people all making progress. So this is a class that like um, Heather dominated for a few years until, until a couple of years ago. And she was winning most of her world, world titles with the sub 400 total. And now the weight class has just ascended. Um, Next year, probably the podium is going to be like maybe maybe 415. Like that would have been well over the world record a couple of years ago. And that's probably going to be the podium next year. So this is going to be one of the weight classes to watch uh, in the future. We have like a bunch of strong lifters and then a couple of them are juniors or one year out of the juniors. So this is going to be a very exciting weight class to watch. And then on the American side, we have two of the top three lifters right now. And we likely, this will be a class that likely in general will probably have two, two lifters for now. So it'll be a great side to watch, a great class to watch in general. And then also a great class to watch from the American side. Totally. And, um, uh, I just saw today, Jessica Espinal's performance. She had 27 white lights as well. Um, that's what she mentioned. And I, which I didn't even realize that that had happened at the time, but, um, that is amazing. Again, just given what we know about this jury and everything like this and the number of lifts that were missed, um, even in this session, if you're just glancing at it on good lift, there's kind of a lot of red in there and to go 27 white lights. And I think she broke, was it the junior world record deadlift at the end and <clears throat> just great performance. Julia, you got the medal numbers. I do. So Jess got four medals total. Um, two bronze and two silver and Heather got two medals, one gold and one bronze. Um, and yeah. obviously Jess uh, is in the silver medal position overall, Heather in the bronze. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, just like looking at that, that's really cool because I believe Jessica is the only lifter in this weight class that medaled on all three disciplines and total um, because I know Tiff uh, finished in fifth place on deadlift. And so, yeah, um, Jessica, great performance, you know, finishing in third on squat, third in deadlift, and then second in bench and second overall. So great performance, nine for nine. Um, Jessica, I mean, here's another one. First time at Worlds, um, not coached by Steve Denovi, and is getting a, you know, 27 white light performance, ha has a hell of a day her first time out. Um, looked like there's more in the tank. Obviously training's going well. She's super young. She's going to get way stronger than this. Like she's going to go up from here beyond 412 for, for sure. Like Mike said. So I think like we've got one of these rising superstars. She's going to be one of the rising superstars in the sport. 
Um, it was just amazing. Like Jessica and her partner, Alex, I think her husband, Alex, um, you know, they were hanging out beforehand and everything. Like we kind of got to know them a little bit, super chill. We got to see them in their last training session. Jessica was just like so excited when she got her last, um, big, like squat single done and like her last squat session in before. And she was like feeling so good. She was like, this is going to be spicy. Everything's looking great. I know she was extremely nervous, um, for the competition itself. Like, and she even like, there was a moment in, I believe it was like, Mike, I don't know if oh, you weren't in there, but I think it was like after squats, after her first bench or something like this. We talked about it in the post-competition press conference. Definitely go watch her post-competition press conference. I'll be posting highlights from it on Instagram here in the next few days. But um, it was, she got extremely emotional, like just like being there, like all she's gone through, um, being there on the stage with like these superstars, Heather and Tiff and stuff. And it was like the moment got to her a little bit. She she got emotional in the warm-up room but then she never showed it on the platform, right? Like 27 white lights. Like she just put all that aside, went out there and handled business. So amazing performance. I think, I think definitely she should be in the running for like one of the most slept on uh, performances of the competition as well. Like we were talking about that category before could throw her, her in there as well with some of the other ones I've been most slept on. All right. Anything else you guys want to add uh, about the 47s? Any questions or anything? Yeah, I have a question. So, um, you know, we know Heather missed her first two squats um, and was red lighted on her on her third initially. What was it like? Like, what? What? How did she handle that that whole situation? Was she, you know, like, because we only see what happens on the platform, or at least I only saw what happened on the platform. Um, but what was she like uh, during that whole thing? Was she composed? Was she like, you know? Yeah, that's a good yeah. Question. I mean, I mean, uh, I don't know what they showed in the live stream, but um, she missed it and she went over and she was in the middle of shaking the the judge's hands, and then we saw the the jury deliberating over it and they overturned it like while she was walking back to the tunnel. But yeah, I mean, she thought it was over. She went to shake everyone's hands. She was gonna go back and she was fully composed. Yeah, I mean, so like, yeah, exactly. She was fully composed the whole time in the warm up room. Like, while after she missed, you know, she was like talking with the coaches a lot about like, what was this pop? She heard a pop like in her groin area, something like the adductor area. And she was just like, she didn't know if it was safe because like it kind of, I think, mentally freaked her out a little bit because you hear that sound and you feel like something pop and you just think like there's, there's some kind of problem. But she, um, was in, like pretty calm and in pretty good spirits, like given the fact that she was about to bomb out and then, or, you know, it looked like she could bomb out. I know inside I was freaking out. Um, cause I was just like, Oh my God, like this can't happen. Like I, it, it's so shocking to me because like she was poised to put up a really big total at this competition. So, um, super, handled it like a pro, like just like a total pro, like you would expect, like it wasn't getting to her at all. She went out, she just had her, you know, uh, music and then, and then went out and hit it on her third. And then, like you said, yeah, we didn't like talk to her. It wasn't like she, she found out when she was still on the platform that it was a good lift. So it wasn't like she, and she was handling it well. She was going and shaking the ref's hands, you know, and whenever she was kind of told that, no, she got it. So really cool. And then um, afterwards, you know, she was just like, man, if I could have really pushed my squat, like I wanted to, might've been, I'm going to win this thing. And like, she's like, I was, she's like the numbers I was looking at is like, we're going to be right up there in that four twenties. So what does that tell you about what, like, she's already fired up. And I think, um, she, she's on the nominations for, um, girl power in France. So she'll be competing in October again, like she did in France. It's an IPF meet. It's a regional meet. So it could get her into Sheffield to go against Tiff. If she can put up something like a 425 over there, um, which she is fired up to do. So it's exciting because she was fired up going into this. Didn't have the day she wanted again at the world championships, which is unfortunate, but came out of it like in high spirits and then like she was like amazing throughout the rest of the competition like i mean this is one of those things when you see someone like her like just you're a pro like she's just a true pro like mike i think it was the very next day she was on the pregame show with you right and she did yeah. that for like two days she saved delaney wallace from being kidnapped and and god knows what um i mean she just did everything she came down she was like letting other people borrow her track suits because we had some issues with shipping and stuff with that like she just she was a team player, a real team player after this. And like, she was a team player going into the competition, helping with everything under the sun. She was a team player coming out of it. 
So, I mean, you really can't say we got to get her on the podcast. Cause like, you know, I know she can talk a lot about like all the crazy things that happened in the world championships, <laughs> like the yeah. Delaney, like the Delaney story. Wallace, like uh, getting, I want to hear about Delaney Wallace almost getting kidnapped here. I just, you kind of glossed over that. <laughs> yeah. So if you go look at the highlights on our Instagram story under Malta, um, a little teaser, go check that out. Uh, Power of thing underscore America. And, um, you get a little taste of it, but yeah, we'll get her on to tell the full story. And I know Delaney has been already on King of lifts. Uh, they haven't released it yet, but I, I'm guessing he talked about it there, but yeah, I've got it all. I got him retelling the whole thing on video uh, on our Instagram story uh, on the highlights under Malta. All right. So great performances by these two. Um, they really represent team USA. Well, Heather overcoming adversity and coming out that third deadlift was like one of the most spectacular things. I think it was a great way to start off the competition like it was like holy shit like this is going to be an amazing world you know Waskar yeah. does his thing jessica goes nine for nine secures the dub and then heather comes back from this like crazy deficit and like freaking pulls this thing to to secure the spot and again i believe her team points finishing in third counted uh for team usa and if they didn't if she didn't get that we wouldn't have won um once again i believe so did they mike i, I gotta look I, i'll check that out while you talk about the next thing yeah it did that because we had natalie gold yeah we had amanda gold a nine nine and an eight that would have been the eight yeah so yep cool uh, so, like a gutsy performance like and we didn't think at that point that 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 necessarily was going to be the difference but wow like it came down to a tie so i i huh. also think that, that was one of the best her heather's third deadlift was one of the best lifts of, of the competition yeah yeah if you want to go solo best lift of the competition definitely one of the best cool because she bl obliterated the world record which we always knew that she could do so all right want to just quickly talk about the 52s we don't have any skin in the game here but go ahead we already talked about it a little bit at the top yeah so, so quick just quick over the, over the 52s is we had a rematch from Sheffield. We had Evie against Noemi. Um, and uh, similar to Sheffield, Evie came out, like projected a little bit higher. And she just, she executed. She hit all of her lifts. She uh, matched her Sheffield total of 460. She was, um, she didn't need her last pull this time. She um, she just came out for her last pull. She went and shook, shook everyone's hands, and it was over. Noemi um, had 450, which a little bit down from Sheffield. Still a good performance, still above what she had done at all previous world competitions. She uh, didn't have the squat day that she's had at Sheffield. Like She squatted 162.5 as opposed to Sheffield, where she uh, had broken the world record. And then on deadlifts, she uh, took 200, which she had more in the tank, but not enough to actually pull for the win. But it was a good performance. Um, and then in third, we had another New Zealand lifter, Megan Lee Smith. Uh, she totaled 437 and a half. Very, very good performance. And that earned her the bronze. And then uh, rounding out the top five, we had Alexandra uh, Aranade. Rovic from Serbia and then Plundecker's uh, fell down to fifth. So um, it wasn't really a battle for gold here at any point. Evie had it basically the whole time. Like it was 10 kilos, which looks close, but she had it at all points. But yeah, no American in it this year. Um, we do have an American 52 who might next year be looking to battle here in Megan Robert. Who and, is on the NAPF team, by the way. And so she will be competing in about four weeks in the Cayman Islands. So, yeah. We'll be curious so to see be, what she does. Yeah, it be interesting to see. I don't think she's uh, with EB or no right now, but um, I'd be curious to see if she totals in the range of where bronze came this competition. So we'll see where she's holding. Yeah. For sure. And there's a lot of 52. Don't we, isn't Jamie Lynn also a 52 as well? Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah. We, we, like, we got some, she's still a bit behind, like, yeah, she's yeah. like behind all of these, but I know she, but I, I see her training like, so, I mean, and Megan Herbert too. So we'll get to see a sneak peek of that of the 52s in uh, Cayman islands. All right, let's move on to day two. Um, so day two, we had the 57s where we have the epic battle between Natalie and Jod 
we know Natalie comes out on top of that one. And then we got the 66s where we have um, one of the most crazy battles, um, one of the most competitive weight classes now, the 66s, where we got our guy, Brian Lee. So, uh, Mike, let's start with uh, the order that it went in, which I believe was a 57s. Yeah, so the 57s were first. And this was one of the more hyped ones coming in, and it lived up to the hype. So we had Natalie Richards at her first international meet versus Ja Jacob, who – um, broke the world record at Sheffield, and she had a great battle last year with Joy um, in the 57s. So this one started off interestingly. Um, we talked about this a little bit on the pregame show, but basically Jod came in with a much higher nominated, not nominated, much higher forecasted total. But yeah, based on France openers. Notorious, right, on openers. France notoriously opens really heavy and takes small jumps, and Jod especially is – known for that and so uh we were discussing how natalie opens light and comfortable and she's gonna be able to make nice jumps from first second third and we we're saying how she can probably pick up 10 kilos on squat from from where they were forecasted and then pick up a little bit on bench and then by deadlift it'll be a battle and that's exactly what happened so jod um ended up she hit all three squats, but she only took a small two and a half kilo jump on her third squat and ended with 182 and a half. Natalie took big jumps and ended with a 180 squat. So only two and a half behind on squat, which was good compared to where they opened that. And then we moved to the bench and uh, Jod took, um, she opened with 95 and then she missed her second and had to retake on her third. So she only ended up with 97 and a half. And then Natalie uh, took two comfortable jumps, hit 107 and a half, maybe had two and a half, maybe not, but she picked up a lot of kilos there and she came into deadlifts with the lead on subtotals by seven and a half, as well as being the lighter lifter. She came in really light, 55.8 kilos was what she weighed in at. Then it comes to deadlift and Jod has on paper the bigger deadlift and she opens much heavier. Um, then they both hit their openers. And this is where the first mistake comes in. On the second attempts, Jod put in a number, put in 222 and a half, which just tied Natalie on seconds, which means that after second attempts, Natalie and Jod are tied and Natalie's lighter, which means that Natalie is technically in the gold medal position. So that was a big mistake because by giving up the lead there, it means a lot of things. But one thing it means is that theoretically, if both the lifters went miss miss on their third, it would be Natalie's. So that was probably a mistake by Team France. I'm not sure exactly what they were thinking. Maybe just they thought that another two and a half might just be too risky that it's cutting into her top end. I don't know exactly what their thoughts are, but that ended up hurting them a little bit. And then comes into third attempts, and a bunch of attempt changes start happening. This is where the game is played. Um, Natalie is coached by Steve Denovi and was being handled by Aaron. They were in contact all together with the American team coaches. And yeah. handled by they Aaron put in a bunch. And Mike, Mike Z. Yeah, Aaron and Mike Z. And um, they were playing around, putting in numbers. And then end of the day, they used their last change and they changed it to 225 for a third attempt, which is something which she hit pretty comfortably. Um, based off that, she probably had – who knows, five to seven and a half more in the tank. Like she made that pull, pull look really good. Which is which, crazy because that was a, like a, a three and a half kilo meat PR. Yeah. I, I mean, it was off of Austin. He definitely peaked really well. It was a very yeah. good pull. Yeah. And what it did, especially as the lighter lifter is it forced Jot to theoretically to pull for the win. She would have to load 233. And this is where the second and much costlier mistake happened. Uh, France put in three, uh, 232.5 instead of 233, which means that even if she hits this lift, she still wouldn't win. Yeah. Um, there's debate going on about whether or not Job realized that before she got to the platform. I'm not sure if she did. I don't know. Either way, I didn't. I didn't um, see anything um, that would indicate it. Um, I think I a lot people, of people, a lot of people in the warm-up room, though, knew when they saw. Yeah, them, I mean, like, I mean, I was watching it from 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 like the corner by the jury, and I see the number, and I'm like, 
okay, obviously they're just, they're waiting until Natalie goes and they're going to change it and whatever. And then I see, I hear bars loaded and I just start like going crazy. I'm like, that means it's over. Once say bars loaded, there's no more changes and it's the world championships. It's over. Natalie won. So we're not sure if she knew, but she came out, she got it like halfway up. She couldn't, or more than that even, but she couldn't finish it. And either way it would have been irrelevant. And Natalie took home the gold with a five, 12 and a half total. So she pushed the world record, another bunch of kilos, uh, phenomenal performance, nine for nine, first international meet, um, best overall lifter. I mean, nothing but yeah. crazy, great things to say. Um, it was a very good battle. And then just after that, we just had round the out, like the top, we had, uh, a good battle for third between, uh, Myra da Silva, which is, uh, from Spain. She just came out of the juniors. She was actually battling with Jod in, uh, junior worlds this past year. And then Bobby Butters, who everyone knows from Great Britain, uh, one of the most hype lifters out there. And they battled for third with Myra ended up taking it on body weight with 472 and a half total. So that's yeah. basically the rundown of the 57s. All right, Julia, you want to go? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. So um, Natalie won four medals, um, one bronze and three gold. Um, obviously, uh, first overall, so gold and overall total. Um, also bench and deadlift and she was uh, third in the squat as well. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I, Jod and Bobby are both known for their huge squats um, and Natalie is right there with them. So uh, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Again, just glancing at the score sheet, it's like, I think she's the only lifter that podiumed in everything. So, I mean, we're kind of starting to see a little bit of a theme there. We've talked about it now with a handful of lifters like Meg, Jessica Espinal now here again, uh, Waskar. So as well. Um, and then, and then Natalie here. So that's really cool. Um, <clears throat> just to give like some little bit of insight, I'm like working on some video footage from this, um, uh, because it was very interesting. The team USA head coach, Mike Z definitely noticed whenever they put in their second attempt on deadlift that, that they had made a mistake, um, that they, that they clearly didn't understand who had the body weight advantage. And that at, at that point on, they were able to take advantage of it. And it was interesting because team France, um, used up their changes too early. Like, so they had put in an opener, then they made a, a bluff change. Then they made a change to what their final number was. And then they tried to change it again to actually add another kilo onto it so that it would have been the winning pull. And Mike Z was standing right there. And he was like, no, they already made two changes. He was telling the score table, like they can't make more than two changes. Um, this is really like a team effort because Arian and Mike Z were like conferring constantly about like what was going on with the numbers and whatnot. And then they also had Tamara Lopes, one of the assistant coaches in there actually going over and making a lot of the changes and stuff, which that's, that's kind of part of like what was cool to see behind the scenes was like how the operation actually works, like who actually puts in the numbers. And so like that way, Mike Z and Arian could still stay back and watch the board while Tamara was over there standing ready to drop a number in um, to make changes and stuff like this and like uh, put in, you know, just make changes to openers and whatnot, things like this. So it was really cool to see the whole thing kind of play out. But yeah, they tried to make a bluff attempt to get Team USA to move off of that, to move up uh, from that 225 or whatever that they had put in initially. Um, like, and so it was a lot of gamesmanship being played and it ended up being the wrong call. They ended up making a mistake there, but in the end she didn't get it, but yeah, who knows if she knew that it was not, not for the win, that would take the wind out of your sails for sure. After a really fast session, not being recovered, like mentally that can really hurt you. Um, also just Matt Gary, got to shout out Matt Gary. Like he made a really great video about this, um, where he goes through and analyzes all the attempt selection, things like this. So go check out his YouTube channel. But like Mike mentioned team France opening super heavy and making small jumps where, and, and you kind of just saw it like, so like two things, one, you end up doing more work to get the same total because all of your lifts are closer to your third attempts. So you're doing opening heavier, heavier seconds. So you're going to gas out a little bit more and she ends up missing her last deadlift. Right. And then the other thing is mentally, just if everything feels heavy and hard all day long, and it's a super fast session, like it has, I just can't see how that, like that has to have an effect on you mentally. Whereas you see the way that Natalie Richards was, um, throughout the day, like she would hit her openers and come off like elated. Like she was so happy with the way that her openers were moving the way her second attempts were moving. She was just like, she would come off the platform and just be like, so ecstatic and 
um, for, for like, how, like just how excited she was about how great her performance was going even on the finals. And then that helps you build momentum up to making your third attempts, which she did. She went nine for nine and, you know, obliterated her own, you know, the world record. I mean, she, she was the first one past 501, 500 kilos. Now she's the first one past 510. She's at 512 and a half now for the world record. It's super cool to do that without taking any chips with no world records on any of the given lifts. Um, it's really cool. Great performance. And yeah, any, any questions or anything, any further comments on that one? Yeah. I'll just add one small thing. Um, so, um, you mentioned that, uh, the squats that, John and Bobby who are known for being like big squatters and Natalie was right with them. So it was actually funny because we were mentioning on the pregame show how there were four lifters who theoretically were in range to take the squat world record, like Natalie, Jod, Myra, Bobby, and, um, and Andre Riley. And we were saying how uh, me and Heather were discussing, like, is this a smart thing? Do you go after or not? And I was saying, Natalie's right with that group. She's a little bit behind, but, but the smart thing to do like, I understand if you're the lifter who's, like, nominated in fifth or sixth, so you want to try to take home that, that squat world record, that squat gold. But yeah. if you're Natalie or even Jod, it's always better. Like, I would say sacrifice two and a half for the five or the seven. Like, if you're going to jump seven and a half or ten and you're not sure, always go with seven and a half, right? Yeah. So, like, um, so Natalie, like, probably could have squatted a little bit more, but she stuck with 180. And Jod actually surprisingly – also took the safe place and went with 182 and a half for squat as opposed to going for the world record. So it's just interesting that the two people who were at the top in this scenario, both of them actually stayed away from trying to take the world record squat. Yeah. Um, but like, just, just on my point. Um, so if you just look at the amount of work that Jod had to do, um, like, so they ended up, she ended up out squatting, uh, Natalie by two and a half kilos, but she did seven and a half more on her second and seven and a half more on her opener. So yeah. she's end up lifting 15 kilos plus the extra two. You know, so she ended up lifting like 17.5 more kilos. That's, that's like over 30 pounds, right? Like that's a, that's a chunk. And like on a, on a day when you're going to get gas out and it's going to be tough. Um, like, I just don't, I don't like this attempt selection strategy. Like uh, this is, a, this is a perfect example of why a lot of people follow the Matt Gary method of like opening safe, not doing too much extra work and then going on and, and, and building up momentum and like making lifts, making lifts and making your thirds, um, and then going nine for nine. So anyway, um, really that's just a perfect example. Like if you want a real world example of looking at it and just adding this number up. So anyway, um, any final, any other thoughts on this? All right. Yeah. Let's keep it moving. Um, so in the same session, we had Brian Lee in the 66s. Go ahead, Mike. So this session was an interesting one. So coming in, we had four lifters nominated. Oh, we really had three lifters nominated right by the world record being um, Kyoda uh, Kasaman from Thailand and Brian. And then a little bit behind them, we had Panna from France. Now, of these four lifters, this is Brian's first international competition. Uh, Kyoda did Sheffield but his total also wasn't from like an international competition, his, his top total. And then Kasseman set the world record at uh, the Asian championships, but also not really, hadn't really done like a crazy total at worlds. Pan on the other hand has already been a world champion, been to multiple world championships. And this was a very interesting competition. So coming in uh, on openers, Brian had a little bit of a lead, um, like he was close, he was a little tight with Kyoda and then Pana a bit behind them, and then Kasaman uh, was a bit behind. So I believe he might have been like slightly injured or something on the day because he didn't really come close to his his best numbers. But after squats, it was already uh, down from a four way to three way battle. So on squats, um, Brian hit his opener, Kyoda hit his opener. Hannah hit his opener. Kasseman missed his opener. We come to seconds. Brian hits his second squat, 242 and a half. Actually, he didn't. This is what I was saying earlier. He actually didn't. He got two reds. But this time, the jury, again, overturned that to a good lift. That was what I was referring okay. to early when I said the other one with the U.S. Um, Panna goes to 247 and a half. He hits it. Er, um, Panna hits second. And then Kyoto hits second. Um, Kasaman retakes opener and he hits it. Then we go to thirds. 
Brian just takes a small jump at this point. He was like close to top end and he couldn't get it. Um, and then Pana and Kyoda end up with 247 and a half, Brian with 242 and a half. And Castleman tried taking a big jump from his theoretical opener and ended up not getting it. So he was left with 235, which basically at that point, he was already out of the running. Yeah. Um, we go on to bench. And then on bench, Brian has by far the lowest bench of these three competitors. So he hits the opener. They all hit their openers. Uh, Brian hits 152 and a half for his second and misses his third, which is only two and a half more. Uh, a bit less than he had hit in training, but I don't know what the specific factors that caused it were. I mean, he came in pretty light. He didn't have to cut. So yeah. there's nothing specific with that, but whatever it was, he ended up with 152 and a half. And then Kyoto ended up with 170 and Panna ended up with 172 and a half. So they both took a big lead on bench. They both, uh, they outbenched him by 17 and a half and 20 kilos. Mm -hmm. So on subtotal, uh, Brian was in third and he was like pretty far behind in terms of subtotal, but Brian is the big deadlifter and that's where he gets his biggest advantage. And here's where the U S mistake started. Mm -hmm. Um, he had put in 300.5, which was the world record deadlift for his opener. That was subject to change based off what was going on at this point, based off the openers put in for Pana and Kyoto the opener for Brian should have been dropped at 297 and a half. For some reason, I don't know. I never got the answer from anybody afterwards, actually. For some reason, that never got dropped. So he opened with 300.5, pretty heavy, but he did ha hit it. And that means he had a three kilo lead after the opening round of deadlifts. So you're saying why he should have done 297 and a half is because that would have given him the tie, and then he's got the body weight advantage. Is that right? Yes. And, and so, so, so if everyone missed every lift after that, he would be in the lead and he yeah. would win. Yeah. Right. Just and, and, and with the need. minimum, with the minimum amount that you would need. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Now we come to second deadlifts and this is where the second mistake happens. So Kyoto, who hit 275, he jumped to 292.5, took a 17 and a half kilo jump. Panna, Took a jump to 285. 15 kilos. From uh, what? Yeah, 15 kilo jump. Yeah, from 270 to 285. So that would put him with a theoretical 705 total. And Kyoto's jump, theoretically, if he hit it, would put him with a 710 total. Now, here is the thing. Uh, like I mentioned on the pregame show and I mentioned to the team coaches, Kyoto, in general, every time he gets into his top end, his lockouts are all soft. Every one of them. His 292.5 was basically something that he had done in training and was soft basically every time. I didn't think it was in the tank. It wasn't. And our real worry was to stay with Pana. And theoretically, if Kyoto hits it, we always have a third attempt to match. Yeah. Now, there's two decisions here in terms of what to jump, Brian. Decision one, if you believe Kyoto really has that deadlift, you would then jump to tie Kyoto. Decision two, if you don't think Kyoto has that deadlift, you would jump to tie Pana. What they did instead was take a jump to 312.5, which did nothing. It was two and a half more than what you needed to match Pana, so actually two and a half for no reason, and two and a half less than what you would need to match Kyoto. So it, was, it didn't do anything in either direction. It was like, I mean, the right number was... 310. 315, while being the wrong number, would at least have a reasoning to it. 312.5 was just a number that should not have been put. Yeah. Um, it was a mistake there, and he took it, and he didn't finish it. Apparently, um, he said after the press conference that he had started cramping. Um, his form had started cramping. I don't know what specific, but his form had started cramping, and it it made his grip hard, hard to hold the bar and he wasn't able to hold on to it. Yeah. Um, it was cramping really bad. It was cramping going into his opener and it was like, they were like working on it really hard in the warm up room after his opener. Um, he came off and he was just like, ow, like it, it's, it's, it's hurting bad. So definitely oh, okay. he had definitely, it was like noticeable to everyone in the room and like, and, uh, his, I forget the name of the guy that was with him, but he was, he was like his uh, personal handler, his personal game day coach, Jason, uh, Jason. That's right. And, and they were, they were working on it really hard and everything, like trying to like get some knots out and just like, 
Oh, so I actually train. didn't know that. See, that's that's yeah. insight. I didn't know I wasn't in the warm up room, so I did not. Yeah, I did not. I didn't know there was anything like that had happened until afterwards. I just thought, okay, he didn't execute or whatever. So that's all the more reason to have taken three ten or even something smaller than that three three oh eight or something. You know, just something yeah, so, to like build up to, because like you, he his opener was a little slow, and so like. But the other thing is, he might have never. He maybe he wasn't going to get more than one lift anyway because of the cramping situation. Like it was pretty bad. It's possible, uh, but it's always every time you overload the bar, it's just like uh, that's a way. Like you're going to increase the chance. That I don't know in that scenario whether two and a half yeah. less was there, but two and a half less would yeah, have been yeah. what he needed. Anyway, <clears throat> so then we come to third deadlifts, and Kyoda. Um, oh, actually, Panda goes first. So Panda puts in five more, two ninety to try to just extend his lead a little bit. Um, he misses, he, he, which he did two two ninety two point five, so seven and a half. Two ninety two point five, right? Yeah. Um, my mistake to, to push a little bit. He misses, which was as expected because 285 was like very top end. Like it was a very difficult lift. He had like made a big jump and like, it was, it was basically presumably what was there. Like it was the third attempt kind of on a second. Then Kyoda again, tries to, at this point, Kyoda cannot drop to mini he again. He, he also would have only needed uh 287.5. Um, but again, you can't go down. So 292.5 yeah. is what he was f forced to retake. And basically it was identical to his second attempt. Um, he pulled it was soft. Didn't get it like literally a, a repeat. Yeah. And now Brian, again, like we said, can't lower it. So he's forced to come out again to 312.5 and he again his forearm was cramping and he couldn't get it so he misses and finishes with 695.5 and he takes the silver and pana finished 705 and retakes his world championship and kyoda came in third with 692.5 and then uh all the way down to fifth was casting on the 657.5 and 665 for uh yusuku sataki the other uh japan lifter in fourth. So that was basically the, the rundown of the 66s. Yeah, man, that was a really great breakdown on that. Um, I think Matt Gary is definitely gonna be doing a video about this one as well. Um, just overall like openers too heavy. And it's interesting because we talked about France generally opening too heavy. Um, and maybe team USA got baited there with, uh, Pana opening with that 270 and then jumping to 285. Um, and making it look like his total was going to be a lot more than it ended up and just knowing full well that he was just going to win it on his second attempt. But, um, Julia, any, any other thoughts or rundown on this one? Um, no, just, uh, Brian finished with two medals. Um, and so obviously silver in the overall and gold in the deadlift with a world record on his opener, which yeah. uh, shouldn't be understated because that's a very impressive feat of strength, but, um, yeah, yeah. I, nothing really to add. It was nice to see Pana um, win, even though, you know, I'm always going to support Team USA. Uh, he's been through a hell of a lot, and, um, you know, he, he showed a lot of heart. So, yeah. It was, it was... Yeah, he's, he's a great guy. He's a really great guy. Um, I, we got to hang out with him a little bit here and there, and, and um, <clears throat> does a ton for the sport. And, um, yeah, so if you're going to lose to someone, hey, hats off to him. He, he, came out and performed. It was interesting because on deadlifts, um, I believe it was on, I believe it was on deadlifts. I can't remember exactly what point it was, but, um, someone grabbed Panna's headphones off the table in the tunnel and it wasn't me. Um, but someone did, and that wasn't one person on his team. And he was like pissed, like looking for him. Like he couldn't find him and he really wanted to put on his headphones. And he was like, he came back in and was like looking around, like looking around a lot, couldn't find him. I can't remember exactly when this happened. It might've been on bench or it might've happened at some point. Um, um, but he, he, and, and, and he was like, he kind of looked at me and I just was like, dude, I didn't take your headphones. Like, I promise you, I did not take your headphones. Like, I don't know if I was, why I was feeling guilty. Cause everyone was kind of around that table. So you just kind of looked guilty if you were standing around there. Um, but then he was like, after later on, 
um, he found the person who had put him in their pocket or whatever. And it wasn't malicious or anything like that, but he was like, he's like, it's okay. He's like, I used it for fuel. You know, like I used it to fuel me the anger for not having his headphones to fuel him. So, um, super sweet guy. Like he, he was definitely intense in that moment. I was like, Oh man, this guy's fiery. Um, but then like throughout the rest of the competition where we saw him hanging around, whatever, super sweet guy does a ton, like the silent worker meet, uh, shout out like they they did a great job like people in the u.s are talking like we need a silent worker meet of our own um so pana if you hear this or leah like hey come run a meet over here uh silent worker usa get this silent worker usa division going um but yeah really cool uh to meet them and like and and like brian he's young um he's much younger than pana you know so uh like what is it? Five years younger. So he's got a bright future in the sports still, um, game day selection stuff. Like, um, you know, there's kind of like a miss. I, I know this, the reason why that three twelve was loaded and it was because of some miscommunication between the head coach and the personal coach, Jason and the lifter, um, in, and just not getting everything straight after that deadlift opener again, though, like Mike said, looking across the board, if you just look at the attempts, looks like they just opened heavy on everything and like weren't weren't on point with the strategy so um that's what happens in the world championships you can be the strongest lifter i mean he had the biggest total coming into this but unless you can every single person on the team and and the lifter goes out and executes perfectly someone's going to take your gold medal from you and penna is that guy so um hats off to him uh, and brian you know super proud of his performance like he composed him he this was his first time at the world championships and he came and did his press conference afterwards even though obviously he was feeling like he got punched in the gut you know um and just s- sweet kid good bright future in the sport smart guy he's gonna get these things figured out and he's gonna come back and i think too like i, I don't know if he was kind of coming into this feeling like hey i'm the i'm, I'm the favorite i'm gonna win this easily or whatever Um, but now he's fired up now. He like is again, like he sees like, Hey, I can't cakewalk into this and expect to win just because I got the biggest nominated total, like, like, which you, he can do in other places, you know, maybe at nationals, he got away with it, but at nationals, he had a really perfect game day strategy as well. So I don't know. Anyway, let's move on to the next one. Unless there's anything else there. Yeah. Good to go. All right. So next we have what was arguably the most hyped, most packed session of the entire day. And that is the 63s with, you know, spectacular performance from Corolla and Meg Scanlon and the 74s with Taylor Atwood and, you know, Carl and Tim. So Mike, uh, go ahead and take us away on the 63s. So I'll start with the 63s. Um, the 63s, they were kind of as expected. Um, Corolla put on an absolute show. She uh, took... Leah's world record. Uh, she totaled 557.5, came second best overall lifter. But not to not to like forget, uh, Megan Scanlon, the last year's world champion, she put up an incredible performance. Uh, she totaled 532.5. She had a 195 squat, which was a squat PR with, with more than tank, uh, three for three there. She went two for three on bench, 127.5, missed her second on bench depth, uh, retook in her, uh, went up two and a half on her third. Uh, looked very similar that time. They liked the bench step. I don't know. Nobody there, including the refs and the jury, understand bench step rules. I mean, the refs called the good. The jury looked at each other like, I don't know. They have no idea what's going on and overturned it. And then she hit a 210 deadlift to cap out the day. But, uh, I mean, she's the ultimate competitor. Um, for those that were watching in the venue or if you were paying, like, close attention to the attempts and attempt changes – um, before Corolla hit her third deadlift, Meg had 230 in. Uh, she was going to pull for the win if it was like even like remotely realistic. I don't think 230 was remotely realistic, but like anything that was like possible, she would have pulled for the win. So yeah. she's a gamer. Uh, she's making progress. It's a little bit under her best total, but that was with the old bench rules and with like a, ma- a monster bench. But she's making good progress on squats. She's making progress on deadlifts. She's getting used to the bench rules. Uh, I expect by the time we come into next world, she'll be at least in the mid 540s, pushing probably 550s. Um, so she had a great day. And then uh, coming in third was Kiara Bernardi. She was like right there with with Meg on the nominations, but she didn't have as good a day. She finished with 520 total. And then uh, in fourth uh, was Joy moving up from the 57s. We don't know if it's temporarily or permanently. She doesn't know that, so we can't know that. But she had a 505 total and she pulled 
she attempted a massive deadlift on her third, which would have shattered the world record there, would have beaten the world record a week us up. And uh, she got two reds. I thought it was a good lift, but whatever. Uh, the judge, juries, whatever, disagreed. That was just one other thing to note from that session. But that, that would have been crazy. And but otherwise... Pulled, pulled her also into third. Right, right. That would have that would have pulled her into third. But and otherwise, just FYI, uh, uh, she, she weighed in at 62.5. So it wasn't like she lied. Wait, weighed in as like some super light 62, 63. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, sounds just by, by the looks of that, it's probably going to be a 63 now. So I, I, I spoke to her after the competition. She's still not sure. Like she was happy like to eat into the competition. Like she wasn't like just going up a weight class like to see like she, once she was going up, she like ate. But um, yeah. she's still unsure where she's what she's doing next. But overall, it was I wouldn't say the most battles because Crowler really was in her own world in terms of uh, what she put up today or put up on that day. And then Meg ended up like putting up a pretty – impressive second place and then beyond that was Kiara and then Joy pulling for third but it was just some good performances and like some good individual lifts um Corolla attempted the world record bench she didn't end up getting it but she put up a, and then Joy obviously like we said with that lift so it was just overall it was a, a good session and we saw some pretty impressive performances for sure Julia you want to give your take on this this is your weight class yeah. So uh, first, I'll just say, um, Meg got um, a medal in all like three lifts and the total, which is very impressive. Um, obviously, silver overall, and I believe gold or um, oh no, silver obviously in bench and uh, squat, squat, and, right, and a bronze on dead. Yeah. Um, she did really well. Um, you know, 57.5 is just a monstrous total for a 63. Um, but uh, 532 um, and not even really, you know, at the top end of what I think that she's capable of is um, she's closer than I mean, I, I, I think she and her coach realize how close she is, but I think that she's closer than a lot of people realize. And um, definitely, I think that this class, um, you know, Leah moving up to 69, everyone thought, you know, maybe this weight class isn't going to be the one to watch anymore. I still think it's the one to watch. Yeah. I still think that it is probably one of the most insane weight classes, if not the most insane weight class and, and, and will be. Uh, for a while just because of the depth of talent in there there's people um that you know we're barely gonna hit on here who are totaling over 500 kilos um, yeah. and you know, a lot of these these lifters are are highly competitive if not on the podium a weight class up so for sure um kiara is born in 98 um she's 10 years younger than meg so like what a cool i mean it's just cool and then and then curl is kind of right in between. So um, <clears throat> definitely Meg is on the come up. Like I just, just interviewed her today actually for a podcast and she is talking about um, some pretty big numbers. So you'll have to listen to it and hear what she has to say, but um, just a teaser, like it's some very impressive numbers because like you said, the 127.5 on bench, she only went up two and a half from her missed second um, which was from a technicality, but she could have gone up a lot more than that. Like she, that looked like a easy second attempt still like it looked, it flew, absolutely flew. And she's making quick progress on everything else as well. Um, she's just on one right now. And I do think it's kind of a three-way show in between the 63s and the 69s um, between Corolla, Leah and Meg Scanlon. I mean, she's the only one I feel like that's right there and she's doing it at the lightest body weight of any of them. Um, Leah's doing it at like a couple kilos above this weight class but not really fully as a 69 so when you take that into account if you think like they're really all three kind of like 63s that's a pretty awesome grouping 532 and up first from basically like 65 and below lifters right like that's that's spectacular so i would love to see all three of them go to sheffield and battle it out because i think again like if you add on if you if you let uh meg eat into that and build until february she'll be right there she'll be absolutely right there with everyone else so all right. Any other takes on this one? 63s. Um, 
just Meg was in her own world. Listen to her podcast. It's coming out. I recorded it today. Um, it'll come out after this, but, um, she was in her own world on, on meet day. Um, like she was just like vibing, having a blast. She talked about in the post game press conference. You can check that out too. Like she's been training herself to have fun at these meets and like the mental game, she has it on lock. Like if, if anyone's listening, you can learn so much about the mental approach to these competitions by going and listening to everything that makes Galen's recorded. Um, because like, she just got the best mental approach. I think of almost anyone in the game right now. And that's another factor of why I think she's making quick progress on her total, um, on all three lifts and is a threat in this weight class and in the 69s. So, all right, Mike, take it away on the 74s. So onto the 74s, uh, definitely one of the most talked about weight classes from this world. So coming in, we had Taylor obviously nominated first, and then we had a couple people, a couple of the younger kids uh, closing in a little bit. And then also we had Jell from Norway. So Shell actually ended up lifting in the B flight. So he was not in the prime time session. He was earlier and he totaled 760, uh, would have been 770, but the jury overturned his last deadlift. So that was the number coming into prime time that obviously everyone had to beat. Now, I guess there's four main people. Um, I mean, it's really three, but four main people that were in the prime time session to talk about. So we obviously had Taylor. We had Tim Monagati from New Zealand, who coming down from the 83s. We had Carl Johansson, the junior world champion. And then we had Chan Chia Fan, um, another flex athlete from Chinese Taipei. So those were the lifters to talk about. So um, the numbers were decently close on, on uh, nominations for all of them. So they were all like within realm for potentially winning, meddling, everything. So starting off on squats. Um, so... Uh, Carl went three for three and ended up with 267 and a half. And um, Tim Adagati went three for three and took the world record on his third, 283 and a half. And uh, Chan Chia Fan went two for three, finishing with only 252 and a half, missing his third after taking a 12 and a half kilo jump. Now, Taylor it was a little controversial. He opened with 255, jumped to 270, hit it. Went to 277.5 for his third, but the jury did not give him the lift. So that was yeah, seven two, and a half kilos. Two white lights and then overturned by the jury, right? Um, or I'm was not it two reds? Sure or was it two way. reds? I think, no, it has to have been two reds because okay. Mike Z came out and if it was, it was two whites. Okay, okay, there, okay. Yeah. And the jury, so, jury wasn't going to give it. Okay, got it. Right. So, um. So that was a bit controversial. Uh, not exactly sure what the Reds were for. It was a little bit between everyone. Nobody well, was exactly sure. One was a red card, right? And it was depth. And then the other one was a yellow card, I think, which was a mystery right. what it was, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that, that was the mystery part. So um, that was seven and a half kilos that obviously would come back to hurt him, but that was a little controversial. Then we moved to bench. And on bench, um, Carl goes through for three and ends with 182 and a half. And then Tim gets only his first two, ends with 170. And here, Taylor, in true Taylor form, he goes three for three, 197 and a half. Um, and he, coming to deadlifts, he still has he still has the lead. So he's in control. But unlike usual, Taylor here was not the biggest deadlifter, which means that obviously he's got to hit his lifts. But more than that, he's not going to get to pick exactly what the right number is to load. He's going to have yeah. to load what he thinks and then hope to make other people push other people out of their comfort zone. So opening deadlifts come, um, Taylor opens with 292.5, Tim opens with 297.5 and Carl opens with 305. Um, like is usually like the Swedes usually do. He, I had a lower opener in and then raised it at the beginning, the Swedish national team, some of the best coaches out there. They do it basically every time I saw it coming because uh, he did this against me in Turkey. So I, this time knew it was coming, but either way. Yeah. So they all smoke their openers. Like they're all, they all like have room. So comes to second attempts, uh, Taylor jumps 17 and a half to 310, hits it decently comfortably like i wouldn't say really like super easy but definitely had some 
Um, Tim goes to 315, also hits it, um, also moved okay. And Carl goes 320 and basically smokes it. So now we're coming to third deadlifts. And Taylor has the lead. T Taylor, um, in terms of actual total, has, has 777.5. And the other two lifters are a drop below at uh, 769 and 770. 70. So, yeah, they're right behind him. But Taylor is going to be pulling first of these three. So he has to decide what to load. And here is another mistake, I believe. Um, we saw him put in three. Well, he changed it at one point. But um, I was thinking 317.5 for sure is there, seven and a half. And if you want to push it, 320. Go seven and a half or 10 to force the other two lifters to take a pretty big jump on their third deadlift. He ended up, I guess, thinking there was a little more in the tank and loaded 323 for a 13 kilo jump, second to third. And he goes and gets it to lock out, but he never locked that, never locked it out. Uh, he's like sitting there at lockout for a, like a bunch of seconds, feels like forever to everyone watching, but he, he was never able to lock it out and he holds it, whatever, but the bottom line is he never got, he never got it to full lockout. He got three rides. So there was nothing to go to the jury for. And at this point, he's still in first, but now there's two people right behind him who can both pull for the win and both don't need to take big jumps because since Taylor missed, they only need to take their seven, eight kilo, whatever jumps rather than having to potentially go 15 or 15 or if Taylor had hit it, 20 kilos. So next up comes Tim Malagati. He loads 324 and a half for what will be the world record deadlift and to uh, pass Taylor. And he gets it to lock out. Um, Looked like there were a lot of things potentially wrong, like up and down, hitching, this, that. I don't know. A whole laundry list of things you could get reds for. He does get two reds. Uh, we get to see the uh, Usain Bolt 100-meter uh, time from Rory Lynch running to the jury. The jury, um, like, stops him from coming full. They go over the lift. I'm standing right there by the jury, and I'm like, okay, this is – like, they're going to shut it down. That was – like – I don't know how many things went wrong there, but uh, but much to my surprise, and I think most people in the crowds, the jury actually overturned this to a good lift. I was shocked. I think most people were. But at this point, Taylor already lost. That gave Tim the half kilo lead and put him into the gold medal position. And now with the biggest pull, uh, Callie is pulling last, lows 328, which would tie him with Tim, and he would take it on a body weight as he was the lightest of these three lifters. Uh, he loads seven, uh, loads 328. He basically blows it up, probably good for another 10 kilos, uh, and takes the W. It was a pretty crazy session. Uh, the whole podium separated by half kilo. Uh, involved potentially controversial calls, overturns, um, missed lifts, potem potentially bad attempt selections, everything. But it was a pretty crazy session to watch, I'm sure, on the live stream. And it was pretty crazy in, in person. And I would say it was one of the more, um, not necessarily hyped up coming in, but decently, it was getting hyped coming in. And then definitely one of the more entertaining sessions of all of them to watch, hmm. to actually be there for. Yeah, since it was day three, um, there was a lot of people like who had competed the previous days and were going to be competing in the next few days. So it was an absolutely packed house. I think it was the loudest and most packed of the entire week. What do you think, Mike? Um, I'm not sure if it was the loudest of the whole week, but it was definitely full. Um, yeah, the, the stands were packed and there were people standing also. Uh, so it was definitely, it was definitely close. This was and before was, they added in the extra seating. Um, but right. Yeah. What do you think? Maybe the next session Delaney yeah. session might've been the most packed. I think, I think the most packed was actually maybe the 93s. Yeah, 93s, because that's also the 76s, I believe, right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, it was pretty stacked. But this right, is pretty Julia, cool. Julia, yeah. what, what was your take? Go ahead. Yeah, so um, I think I, I touched on this. I didn't realize that Taylor had gotten three reds for his lift. Um, I actually did think it was locked out in the end. Um, but, again, I wouldn't have given it white lights either. Um I was quite surprised uh, that Tim's was overturned to a good lift. And I think that that was um, 
you know, like it, it, it was just very controversial. Very, there was a lot going on there. Um, Taylor did uh, manage to get two medals. Um, you know, he finished third overall, and I think he got a silver in bench. Um, yeah, I think the Taiwanese lifter took first. I want to say. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was exciting. Um, you know, Kali, is that how you pronounce his name? Um, he, he, he did, I mean, he did what he had to do. He, he hit his lifts and, um, he's put on a, an amazing amount of, like, just, I don't, I don't remember exactly how many kilos, but he was like in the mid sevens, I think. Um, and you know, now he's he's way up there. So um, I mean, there was a lot going on. I don't think that Taylor this was Taylor's best day, um, and I I think that he can do a lot better. Um, but it was really exciting to watch, and um, <laughs> a lot of people, you know, they're like, um, "Cali beat Taylor. Like he's he um, he finally he finally did it." But um, you know, someone finally beat him. But uh, Tim beat him first. So that's something that a lot of people leave out. Um, but yeah, and, I, I think Shell beat him years ago. That's true. That's true. Yeah. But yeah, and then, you know, shout out to Shell like, from the B flight. I mean, that just shows how, how deep this field is that someone like that is, is in the B flight. But yeah, I mean, very exciting. Um, obviously, not what we at Powerlifting America wanted, but um, I think it made for some very good. Uh, very good viewing experiences. And I think that that, um, like people are talking about this a lot and that's ultimately very good for the sport. Yeah, it's good for the sport. Um, Taylor, he was upset. There's no question about that. Like he was not in a good mood um, after getting that squat overturned. Um, he was he was pretty hot when he came off the platform when he had finished his nine attempts. And um, and rightfully so, I think like he, he's a fiery competitor, fiery athlete like that. And so, I mean, I think, I think he had a right to be upset and, um, but despite all that, he was still like a, a real good sport about it. Went out there on the podium, you know, took his bronze medal, um, was doing, everyone came up to him before awards even happened. People in the warm-up room are coming up to him to do self, take selfies with them and stuff. And he's, he's doing it with everyone. You know, he's like, he's taking selfies with everyone being like the ultimate ambassador for the sport. Like he always is. So if anyone can take one on the chin, and uh move on and continue to push and come back with a vengeance it's going to be taylor so we talked about it a lot on the previous episode so we wanted to go into it again uh but on part one you know we talked a lot about like what the future might be for taylor but um definitely he's going to come back and he's pushing right now for sure so all right any other thoughts on this one no um okay let's move on then uh so the day after this we had a break and uh, what'd you do on the break there, Mike Gold? Uh, let's rehash it one more time <laughs> since we talked about it on part one. <laughs> uh, I, I the sunburn asleep. of a lifetime. I fell asleep in an oven. Yeah. The and sunburn... uh, I blame Eric Helms decided not to wake me up. He said they were discussing whether or not they should wake me up and they decided not to. So I got burned because of them. And I think you can also blame uh, Megan Bryan Scanlon a little bit. Uh, yeah, for your, for, Meg, because... it's your, Megan Bryan, it's your fault. And, and Kelly Mann and everyone from the Performotion Performotion crew, because yeah, uh, after after the session, you know, we had to go out and lick our wounds from Taylor's loss and pour one out for the homie, and then we also had to celebrate Meg's amazing performance, which we did uh, pretty much all night, and that's why Mike fell asleep on the boat and got the sunburn of the century. Oh, I don't even know if I mentioned it before, but such falling asleep on the boat i fell asleep on the bus to the boat also and had to be woken up by the driver when everyone was off the bus god man people were just trolling you they're not even gonna wake you up they're just like walk out and make the drive yeah. up that's cold that's ice cold um all right let's so we had the day off that's also the day when we had the break uh, we had the general assembly talked about world games talk about power of the america become a full member all that we talked about it on part one so let's move into the next day then uh, which would be, what is that, day four? And we had the 69s. Um, yeah, I'm right. 69s. Yeah. And we had uh, the 83s. Um, so we had our girl, Chelsea Savitt, in the 69s. And we had Delaney, the reigning world champ, who would become the two-time world champ in the 83s. 
So go ahead and take it away, Mike. So the 69s, um, it was kind of, as kind of expected, it was, we had a battle for, a ba- uh, we had Leah basically run away with first. Um, she told 549, she didn't need to come out for a third deadlift. But then we had a very good battle for the next bunch of spots. So on the nominations, um, the nominations and on the projection and on the, uh, the forecasted, so Martha Jenner was like in second, and then there was Clara and Chelsea, and then some other, and then Sarah Naldi. Um, those are like the other ones who were mainly supposed to be at the top. Now, um, on squats, uh, Chelsea had a great day, hit 187.5, um, five of less than Martha who hit 192.5, and then Clara hit 182.5. And then also Sarah Naldi, also 192.5. So they were decently like a, a tight grouping after squats. Um, on bench, so Chelsea here is was the bench god. Uh, she got a nice bench. So she went and hit 127.5. So she uh, covered the gap that she was missing on squats from some of them and then extended her gap on Clara. So she had the subtotal lead of, well, not lead, but the lead of these three who are all, these four actually, yeah. who are all battling for second through whatever. So then after them coming to deadlift, so this is where, so Chelsea has the, doesn't have the biggest of the deadlifts here. So coming to deadlifts, Chelsea opens with, um, what was she opened that lift with 205 right which she missed so she opened yeah. and she misses now this is where it gets like a little bit nervous because not only did she open with 205 and she missed it but her pr coming in was uh right around this so she was opening really heavy and missing now when you open really heavy and you miss often that uh doesn't work out so great. But here, she not only uh, yep. hit her second, but she went up to 210 and she hit her second to keep her like in the running. Then on the seconds, um, Marta hits 220, 220 and then uh, Clara hits 222.5 to put her uh, like tied with Chelsea and put her in the uh, bronze medal position. Chelsea's um, PB, Ch- Chelsea's PB, by the way, was 205 coming into this. So. Okay. I wasn't sure it was 205 or, yeah, okay. So now we come into the third deadlifts. And um, so Chelsea goes first and she takes a five to a jump. Uh, she hits 215, um, maybe a little bit in the tank, but not so much, which actually is just the whole thing is a little interesting because if 215 was around her plan third, 205 obviously is a super heavy opener. I don't know if they thought there might have been a little bit more in the tank, like had she hit her opener. But definitely, either way, so they, she, did. they definitely did. I can confirm. Right. They, they, they were yeah. targeting like 217, 220 range. So, okay. Um, reasonable. Even still, probably a little bit heavy of an opener. But, um, but she hits her 215. So she does what she needs to do. So now at this point, um, after hitting her 215, so she puts herself in, in a bronze medal position. Interesting that she, she picked uh, 215, um, which which put her like two and a half behind uh, Marta with time and still finished in silver. But so she picked 215 and she hit it. And then it was left to Clara who had to load 227.5 or 500 pounds for a 69 junior, um, 21 years old. And then she loads it and she hits it and she was able to take away bronze from Chelsea, but basically second through fourth, Martha, Clara, and Chelsea all finished within two and a half kilos at 532.5, 530, and 530. So Chelsea put up a great day. Uh, she PR'd everything. She PR'd her squat. She PR'd her bench. She PR'd her deadlift. Nice PR on her total. And Look. she finished right off the podium, but tied. So she's, she's only 19 kilos away from uh, the world record. So yeah, Listen, we everybody's everybody's close here, and she's within striking uh, distance for next year. She's gonna put a few more kilos on her total, see where and where she lands, 
and uh, she's looking for a podium spot for sure for next year. That's definitely going to be her goal, and we're going to have to see. Uh, she was like, I have to make it there first. I'm like, Chelsea, it's yours to lose. If somebody wants it, they're going to have to take it from you. So yeah, we think, uh, yeah. No, she she had a great performance, and I think she had a little bit more in the tank on on a couple options here and there, and coming down to two and a half, that'll eat you up afterwards when you're thinking about, like, damn, like, and that's another two and a half. We don't know what Claire might have been able to pull, like, had Chelsea gone a little more, but um, that was one where I think I remember them doing the calculus on it, and they didn't want to make as big of a jump because they actually needed five kilos more in that last deadlift in order to beat Marta because Marta had the body weight advantage. Yeah. So they, they thought five, you know, five more in addition to already jumping up five kilos. It was just, it was, uh, or whatever it was that she jumped. Yeah. Five kilos. So it just was too much, um, to ask. And so she can do five thirty, and then make Clara go out and pull for that podium spot, which she was able to do. She was able to answer the call and she did exactly what was necessary just to finish in third. So probably she didn't think she had much more than that. Otherwise she would have pulled two and a half more and tried to take the second place spot. Right. So, so very close, very tight battle, very interesting the way it all shook out. Um, and yeah, great performance. She's fired up now. She definitely had two and a half on something like, um, left there probably on deadlift for sure. Um, just given the way that the opener missed the opener on like, just a, wasn't it just like a bobble at the top? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right. Julia thoughts on this one. Yeah. So Chelsea actually got a golden bench. Um, and I, I agree with you. Um, I think that she, she had a lot more in deadlift. It almost looked like she missed her opener because she pulled it too fast. Um, yeah. And I, I, it's unfortunate, but uh, you know, it is what it is. And and I don't blame her for taking the attempts that she did under the situation, um, the, like in the situation she was in. Um, but yeah, that being said, she, she has a lot more in the tank on deadlift. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, this time next year she is uh pulling uh five in the fives um yeah. that's, that's my prediction and i think she's going to be a real threat to the podium next year yeah i know she just hit a pr a deadlift pr yesterday or something like she's pring all the time too like her training is just going really great i think i think it's like we mentioned already previously in this episode like she's just everything's starting to click the mental game the training game her her game day performance she goes six for six recovers from that missed opener and hits two more deads like just a great performance a gamer um she'll be ready she'll be ready next year for sure all right um so along in this same session we had mr two times now mr two time delaney wallace in the 83s which was also a battle so mike gold take us through so the 83s uh unlike i guess the uh the 69s was not really what was expected so coming in we had i think the people expected a good battle for the gold between delaney and jurens delaney who had totaled 835 at sheffield and jurens who had put up an 820.5 at the british nationals and they expected like a good battle there and then they're expected to be like a pretty wide battle for third between like maybe eight, nine people. Like there were a lot of people down the line who could total between, who knows, 770 and 810 or whatever. So that was what was expected to happen. But they didn't go as planned. And um, as uh, Nick Commander said on his podcast, he doesn't think any single 83 was happy with what happened on the day. So to start, um, so Delaney hits his opener and second squat, but then his third squat, he hits 302.5 and does a nice little dance and the jury overturns it. Now, the whole thing was ridiculous. Uh, he got two whites. He got a red from the center judge on depth. One of my pet peeves is there should never ever be two whites where the only depth ju- depth call is from the center judge. Makes no sense. The center judge is the worst depth thing. Look, well, both side judges think it's depth. You shouldn't be calling that. But anyway, whatever. Not sure why the jury overturned it, but it is what it is. But besides for uh, him not hitting it, so Jurens missed his second uh, 305 on strength and then again on his third. So starting off the top two, we had only two for three on squats for Delaney and only one for three wow. on Jurens. So 
already after squats, we basically no longer had two people battling for the world record. And it was more like, let's see who can salvage their day and put up whatever kind of total. Now, after them, so we had some people have good squat performances. So, you know, went three for three and hit a small PR with a 280 kilo squat. Um, three for three and it's three for three for Amanda's 265. But he was upset with it. Basically, he actually, I just heard this today. He said that um, basically between his first and second squat, he had to go to the bathroom. And for anybody that was there, the bathrooms were really, really far. And he went there and like, he had to like run back to get back like in time because the flights were going really quick. So he literally ran back from the bathroom, like to the platform and like his calf cramped up. So he hit his second squat, but like it didn't move as it wanted. So like the coach only gave him two and a half from second to third. So he was like upset. He felt like he like left five, whatever kilos in the tank there. Yeah. But, um, but he did his, his um, third squat. And then uh, basically most of the other lifters who were, in the conversation, all Mr. Thirds, like everyone else in the prime time, basically Mr. Thirds. Yeah. So there was like very few people having the day they wanted coming in. So then, then we moved to bench and Delaney hits the opener, goes up seven and a half. And again, uh, gets no lift. Um, they called him for, uh, what was it for soft Elbow, elbows? Elbows at, oh, at so the elbows. start. Yeah. It's very confusing um, call. Like, how do you get a how yeah. do you start command if you if your elbows are soft? Like, very very strange right. times here. And so I I'll also get... believe this one uh, might have got called right away, but the squat the squat was overturned like pretty late. Like we thought, yeah, it was, really we late. were celebrating. We really were like, it's great. We're having yeah, a day. Like, well, we saw, yeah, yeah, and it was super late. That's a that's a punch in the gut, man. Like, okay, but anyway, so. Um, Soft elbows at the start for on, on his second attempt. Yeah, so he missed that. And then uh, Ian actually went through for three and then with 155 bench, which is crazy that we're talking the same conversation with the 155 bench. But then there was some more controversy on the second benches with Nick Manders. He goes out there and he's getting ready to unrack it. And he keeps getting told to reposition by the head judge. Uh, apparently they didn't like, they were saying his head's off the bench. His head wasn't off the bench. His hair might've been off the bench, but whatever. So he ended up timing out. So both uh, Nick and Delaney both ended up on technicalities, not getting their second benches. Um, Julie, Thank you want to add something to that? Go ahead. Yeah. So um, it, his head was like halfway off the bench. Um, you could like the angle that the camera was showing in the live stream. Um, it like there there was like probably like this much of his head was like off of the bench. Um, and actually uh, what's uh, Joe Wiley was, was talking about it on the, on the, um, oh, on the conference. I mean, I didn't think, I mean, yeah, I, I didn't think it was a reason to like disallow. I don't think it was that egregious, but um, yeah, it, it was mentioned in the live stream, but it, just a bizarre, a bizarre call. Um, yeah. Bizarre and, thing to disallow, you know, a lift for. And Mike, you had a front row view. So what was your view? Honestly, from my view, it just looked like his hair was off the bench and he had that like big hair, like that whole uh, slim shady thing going on. But <laughs> the blonde I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure. But anyway, so right. he didn't get it. So then coming to third benches, Delaney only took a two and a half kilo jump because because of the missed second and he smashed it 195. He was upset. He thought 200 plus for sure. He had hit a 200 double in the gym. Yeah, uh, he like absolutely destroyed that 195. Recent. Yeah. So he was upset with that. And then Manders had to retake with 165 and also smash that. So they both like had lost like at least five kilos there. So that was like frustrating for them. And then uh, a lot more misses from the rest of the people down there also like on the third bench. Like there's just like a, a bunch like a, of bread. A little bit of a sea of reds. Yeah. So then coming to deadlifts, um, at this point, Jerns is gone. Like, um, he, he only had bench. 290 on squat. He uh, only hit two benches with 175. He, he's out of the conversation at this point, really. Um, for the win, at least. So Delaney has, like, the nice lead. He opens 310 on deadlifts, which is kind of heavy. 
Um, but he hits it. Uh, Nick Manders opens at 340, and it's a little too fast, so he missed some balance. And Ina opens at 350 and also hits it. So now, like, at this point, it's it's uh, getting close. Ina's pulling, like, within reason of him. Like, he's not there yet, but he's getting pulling close. Comes to second attempts, and Delaney goes to 325, and he hits it. But, like, it's basically all that's left. He's basically capped out. And Ina jumps to 370.5, world record. And um, he pulls it, and he gets it to pull within nine and a half. To pull within uh, nine and a half kilos of Delaney. So now, coming to third deadlifts, now it's like gonna get crazy because Delaney basically looked tapped out. And with Ina, it's kind of hard to know. Like it didn't look easy, but with such a big puller, it's like so hard to know whether what they have in the tank. We know, obviously, yeah. he's going to load for the win. We just have no idea whether he's going to hit or not. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, Manders comes back and uh, retakes opener and hits it. Coming to thirds. Um, so now Delaney takes a five-kilo jump to try to just, like, put a little bit more on the bar and uh, push, you know, a little bit. But he doesn't have it. So he finishes his day with an 8.15 total, 20 below what he did in Sheffield. Not happy with it. And he gets to be in the same situation last year where he gets to see – you know, load for the win. Um, meanwhile, before Ina goes, um, Manders loads 367.5, and he hits it to pull into third place. Uh, he didn't need 367.5. Um, they should have loaded 365. He lo- went two and a half extra. I don't know what the Canadian coaches were doing, but whatever. Now, Ina loads 380.5 for obviously what would be a world record deadlift, yeah. and he tries to do what he couldn't do last year, which is hit a miracle pull to pull him from way behind the company deadlifts for the win. Um, but this time, actually, unlike last year, he doesn't even get doesn't really get close. Like part of the bar kind of leaves the ground, but he never really gets close. And Delaney can finally settle down and like not happily, but he can take the win. So that was basically the recap for the 83s. Nobody was happy. Delaney only, only told 815 he wanted to break the world record. So it wasn't what he wanted. Uh, Jerns, who came in nominated second, ended up totaling 790 and finishing in, like, sixth, I think. So he was way behind where he wanted. Uh, Ina had a PR day, a good day, 805.5, taking the silver. But he still wasn't happy because, although coming in, theoretically, he might have been happy with silver. That was because he was expecting gold to, let's say, be 835, 845. But on this day, where he could have pulled for the win, so he was also not happy because he couldn't pull for the win. Um Nick came in bronze, which is his, what his goal was, but he also wasn't happy. Nobody was happy. So yeah. it was a session that was close, but not one of the good close sessions. Not good, not close because everybody's putting up great days. Close because we saw a lot of mislifts and people not really hitting what they should. And then a couple people hit around what they should and end up converging together and make it semi-close, but not really the day anybody wanted. So I'll just tell you right off the top, Delaney was not a hundred percent at all. Like he was, he was definitely injured. He talked, he spoke well, um, in the pregame, uh, press conference, uh, the, po- the pre-competition press conference, but he mentioned in the post, uh, competition press conference that he w- had a serious adductor injury that he actually thought about possibly, he told me, I don't know if he said it publicly or not, but that he actually had questions of whether or not he would actually be able to show up and lift. He said he couldn't squat two reds some days, um, in training for this. Like there's a, he, he was, he was actually like much more injured than people let on. And then, um, I hung out with him for several days after the competition, um, after everything was done. Like, so this was like on that Thursday the competition ended on Sunday. I think I kept hanging out with him to like the following Friday. It's so, like a week later. And he was still like, sort of like moving gingerly. Like he was beat up after this as well. So, um, that explains a little bit why like his numbers where he was projecting, he wasn't able to hit those. Um, and why he went six for nine. Um, he was absolutely gassed in time for that third last deadlift. Like the session was moving fast. He'd been punched in the gut a couple of times by the refs. Um, like he mentioned mentally, he was kind of getting down on himself a little bit, but he was, he was staying positive, but like he was saying all the right things and acting all the right ways, but mentally he's like subconsciously it's just take something out of you to like celebrate and think you're going to get this awesome squad and then like have it taken away so um but even on a six for nine day you got to say this about Delaney even on a six for nine day 
even battling this injury, he goes out there, puts up an 815, which not a lot of people have gone into the 800. I mean, there's a lot over, like maybe globally now, but you can see only two here made it into the 800s. And he still ends up winning by 10, you know, nine and a half kilos on a six for nine day. So, I mean, I think that all the hype around guys catching him, um, as far as these lifters are concerned, it's going to still take a little while before the Ina or Nick Manners can catch him in competition. Um, probably his bigger threat will be coming from, you know, someone that is going to come over to power of America will be coming from domestically will probably be his bigger, bigger threat. But I just think if he can do this injured, banged up on a bad day, you know, with some controversial calls, um, and still win by nine and a half kilos on the world stage. Like the man's a competitor. He deserves it. Like no one can ever take away. He's the two-time world champ. Right. So hats off to him. All right, Julia, what do you think about this one? Yeah. So, um, Delaney got three medals, obviously, uh, first overall, and then, um, third in squat and uh, bench. I believe. Yep. yep. Um, yeah. So, um, a couple of things I think, um, so going into those third deadlifts, I actually um, was not like super worried um, after I saw you know second deadlift. I know a lot of people thought that it moved very very fast, but I have never seen you know struggle at lockout before, and that lockout was slow um, for by his standards. Um, so I kind of knew that that Delaney like had it at that point. Um, but I mean, it was, that was, I would say that that was probably one of the most intense, um, like battles in the whole, uh, in, in the whole competition. Um, again, not for good reason, but I was on the edge of my seat the whole time. Um, again, yeah. some of these things like that happen, they're, they're kind of unfortunate, but they make for good viewership. Um, and um oh yeah this would have been boring if delaney if they had given him his third squad i mean you add another seven and a half on there and now he's winning by like 15 kilos and then uh, or more and then you give him you know more he had five more on on bench you know now he's gonna win by 20 20 plus kilos so um that would have been a lot more boring obviously <laughs> it made it more exciting this way yeah yeah i i mean you know, all was not lost, but um, I, I do think Delaney is capable of a lot more. And I think, you know, um, when certain people who we won't name uh, come over to, to uh, Powerlifting America, I think the 83s is, you know, it, it kind of took a hit for a while. And I think it's going to be very exciting to watch. There are a lot of good lifters. I think if Nick has the day he wants, uh, Ina has the day he wants, Jerns has the day he wants, Delaney has the day he wants. This is this class is stacked. Um, so, yeah. but yeah, yeah, good job. It can definitely be more competitive. Um, and then we saw like there was a lot of people missing lifts here who who hit lifts, you know, in previous meets like. Um, talking about Jerns, you know, it put up a great total at their nationals, but then here on the world stage, it's just different. I mean, it's just a different situation and 815 total is like nothing to sneeze at, at this level, you know, like, like I said, like very few people are going to crack into the 800s. Only two did it in this very, very stacked session. So um, yeah, I mean, and Delaney though, like, I do like that even going six for nine, he can do something like this and then he's, he's only eight fifteen and up. Like, this is like a bad day. This will be like one of his lowest, this will probably be his lowest total that he'll ever do again. Um, so like people have to know that like, you better be coming for like way beyond eight fifteen If you're going to try to unseat Delaney anytime soon, if he's healthy, if he has a, a enough time for a prep, like he'll have a good long time here to prep, uh, for Sheffield and he'll be able to pull out something, go for Russ's record and all that kind of stuff at Sheffield. So, and get healthy and all that stuff. So, all right. Um, any other final thoughts on this? Um, it was definitely exciting. Like Delaney was just, you know, nervous wreck in the warm up room waiting for Ina again. And he, we were talking and he just basically like, I'm like, don't worry, man. It's the same situation as last year. He's not going to get it. He goes, yeah, but last year he had to make a much bigger jump 
um, than he did this year. Now he's like, this is, this is within his wheelhouse. It's only a 10 kilo jump. And I don't think that he had been seeing his previous attempts. So I don't think he really knew cause he was focused on his own attempts and stuff. Um, but yeah, like everyone was watching it in the warm up room and Delaney just like absolutely lost it whenever he won. So it was exciting. Uh, we'll be putting some videos out on that for sure. In the coming weeks, for sure. All right. Want to move it on? Yeah. So, uh, the next day, um, we have the, the 76s and the 93s. Yep. So 76s went first. And this is one of the classes that was supposed to be hyped up coming into Sheffield. There was like the three-way battle between Carlina, Agatha, and Jess. That was like the hype thing in Sheffield. Carlina basically like walked away in Sheffield like with a pretty sizable win. But they all got to rematch here with along with um, – uh, our lips of Dana McNeil, uh, Sophia Ellis from Great Britain, and Kimberly Walford, one of the best lifters ever. Yeah. And in, in this session, um, so squats start off like pretty solid. Um, like a lot of the lifters went three for three. Um, Carlina hit 225.5 for the world record squat. Uh, Jess hit 220 for her third for also a massive squat. Agata hit 197.5. So she went through for three on squats, but she had to take really small jumps. She opened with 190 and only jumped from seven and a half from opener to third. Not ideal, probably a little too heavy. I don't know exactly whether they thought there was more on the day, but she did make her three lifts. Uh, Dana hit 200 for her third. So she went through for three as well. And then Kimberly uh, missed her third. So she only hit 180 for her second. And, um, Sophia Ellis hit 177.5. So those squats went well, um, comes to the bench. And again, Carlina goes three for three, goes 122.5. Uh, Agatha takes the world record on her second for 153. She actually took the chip. Uh, she frequently doesn't take the chip. So uh, she actually did this time. Jess also goes three for three, 107.5. And um, Dana just gets her second and she en ends up with 97.5. Coming to deadlifts, like it's still a battle between the three at the top with another battle for like fourth and on. Um, but on deadlifts, so everyone hits their openers. But on second attempts, Jess uh, loads up 252.5 and misses. So this puts her in a tough position at that point. Um, what was Agata, up with that? How, how, did she, how did she miss that? I'm trying to remember what the miss was, but... I, she, it might have been strength. Like, it wasn't like a technicality. It was overturned, I think, wasn't it? Justice? Yeah. Uh, I thought she got two white lights and then, um, but she, it looked like a slight hitch. And then um, she, as she went back to the warm up room, they overturned it. I could be wrong. Oh, though. You no, know, you could be right. You could be right. I that, think you're right because I remember seeing her coming off and, and being happy about it. Right. Okay. That, that, that does make, that makes some sense. Okay. Right. Okay. And then um, Agatha hits 230 for a second. Um, and Dana hits 240. Um, and Carlina takes 242.5. So now coming to thirds, Jess is a, a bit, oh, a nice amount behind now. Uh, she missed her second. She's going to have to take something huge. So uh, it starts with, so first, um, Agatha loads 245 for her third and she hits it to temporarily move into the gold. Um, but then Carlina just takes the small two and a half kilo jump and hits it to lock, lock up gold. And, uh, Jess tried to load 263, tried to take a huge pull to pull for silver, but it wasn't there. And then, um, Kimberly loaded before that. Kimberly, uh, Kimberly actually loaded. What was it exactly? I think it was two, two forty-seven point five, for I think it was Masters World Record or whatever. But um, it was a big deadlift she loaded for, and she initially. I'm not sure if she got two whites and the jury overturned it, or she got two reds and the jury didn't. And the jury didn't. Oh no, she got two whites and the jury overturned it, and she went running to the jury. That was great. Yeah. She was running to the jury like she was so upset, but uh, the jury didn't really, nothing to do about it. 
I have to tell you, Kim, Kimberly Walford, like when I was talking about Taylor Atwood, like she's a different animal, man. Like she is, oh, she was fiery. something else, she, man. Like she is, yeah. Like she, uh, I was probably more scared of her than anyone in the entire competition, to be totally honest with you. Um, like, like she, she was scary, man. When she was going out for that third deadlift, she waits around in the, in the tunnel for a while too, before she, well, goes yeah, out she comes out for all of her lifts. She comes out really yeah. late. Yeah. And it was, oh dude, she was just, it was, it was you know, one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life probably is to be up close and personal w- watching Kim go out for that third dead. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. And then uh, Dana loaded 262, tried to pull for the world record, but it was like a decent amount out of reach. She had said that she would like take a shot at the world record. I don't know what was there. Like she hit 240 in a second, maybe 250. I'm not sure the exact number, but um, yeah. at that point, I guess she, I mean, she could have pulled for fourth, I guess she didn't really care so much to pull for fourth. Instead, she went for the world record. So surprisingly to everyone uh, in this weight class with Carlina, Jessica, Dana, Kimberly, everyone, uh, Sophia Ellis ended up with the deadlift gold with 245, which I don't think anybody really would have predicted coming in. So Sophia Ellis had a with, day. Had yeah, a day. I mean, she had a great day. She, I mean, she did better than expected. Just it was definitely a surprise to see that on for deadlift gold for sure. So it ended up with Carlina first, Agatha second, Jess third, Sophia fourth, Dana fifth, and Kimberly sixth. That was the rundown. And then, I mean, I just want to give an honorable mention because so like the difference between um, Dana 537 and a half, Kim 535, and in seventh place from the B session, Sammy DePass from Jamaica, only two and a half. Uh, what she finished a five thirty two point five, so she finished only two and a half kilos off the goat Kimberly Walford and Sammy. If you don't know, competed at the first Powerlifting American Nationals, uh, represented Team Jamaica. She was at NAPF last year and won. She's the North American currently the North reigning North American champion. And I also believe that she's going to be going back to NAPF. So we'll get to see her again at the North American Championships coming up. And she's just an awesome person. And and I I love to see. Um, some of our North American, you know, you know, going to North American championships last year, you build a bomb with these teams and you don't get to see a lot of them at the world championships, but Sammy was there. Greg Jennings was also there in the 83s representing team Jamaica. So it was just so cool to see and um, cool to see that from the B flight, she cracked into the top eight, top seven, in fact, and future is just really right for her. So I couldn't be happier for her. So, and um, Dana also, she had a great day, like, um, other than missing that bench and then pulling YOLOing sort of um, for that deadlift in the end. I mean, she had herself a, a really good day and was in pretty high spirits. So, and, and she beat one of her idols of all time and one of the greats of all time, Kimberly Walford, which was something that she didn't do last year. And so, you know, that's a win right there too. So, and then Kim too, just like, I mean, this, this session was spectacular with all these ladies. So they're all stars. Um, Julia, what was your take on this one? Yeah, so um, there was actually, I'm not sure how much you guys um, were paying attention to this particular aspect of the of the session, but I think there was a little bit of a deadlift battle between um, Kim Walford and, and Dana McNeil going on here. Um, yep, they and, both finished 240, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think after uh, Kim's got overturned, um, yeah. Yeah, like if she had hit, maybe Dana had would pull something else. Yeah, you're probably right. So I think I think that was that was kind of um, the the situation there. Um, actually, so another thing um, you guys might not know is uh, we were trying to put up these these captions as they were coming out um, as as the lifts were happening, and um, Instagram went down. So, um, oh. it was, so we were trying to do that. And in the midst of that, I, I didn't understand what K- team Canada was trying to do. So I, um, I thought that they had made a mistake and, and, um, I was like, you know, just needs more. I was like frantically trying to message Eric Helms and be like, Hey, no, she needs to like load two more, 2.5 more kilos. Um, but you know, it wouldn't have gone through anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, this was this was really exciting, and um, you know, Dana walked away with uh, a bronze in the deadlift, um, and 
yeah, I, I, I thought that this was uh, probably one of the most exciting battles to watch um, just because um, there were a lot of battles for like the top spot and sub battles and people were hitting their lifts. Um, and that's, that's really what you want to see. Um, so, yeah. All right. So let's move it on to the men's side of this where we had Mr. Undeniable. Julia, do you need to go? Yeah, I got to go. Okay. All right, Julia, we'll, we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thank you guys. Have a good wrap up show. And I'll see you later. All right. I appreciate you. See you. Thank you. Mike, let's move it on over to the 93s um, where we thought we were going to have like a huge battle. We obviously have tons of killers, um, but we have Mr. Undeniable, Jonathan Keiko, run the table and kind of run away with this one. So uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily say similar to the 83s because in this case, it wasn't a matter of like everyone having a bad day. It was a matter of just not necessarily having as close of a battle. But we already discussed the 93s a little bit. So we'll just go over it again. But we're not going to break down lift by lift more. Yeah. We just had uh, our man, Jonathan, just he was perfect. Nine for nine. Broke the world record total. Broke the world record bench. Finished with 888 total. Um, our other lifter, Gavin, for him, it was a lot, a lot shakier. So he opened with... Uh, he opened with 302.5 as his opening squat, and he lost balance. Um, from my angle, personally, it looked like it was high either way, so he would have gotten reds, but he lost balance, so he didn't get his opening squat. He took a small jump to 310 for a second, hit it just fine, three white lights, which really is what you need. Two white lights, not good enough, which is what we yeah. learned this week, and took the jump to 325 for his third squat. So already... Uh, not exactly the day he wanted because um, he He's has in the tank on a good day a world record squat in him. He has loaded it. He loaded 335 at Sheffield. He hit it, got a return, but he's got the strength for it. So already he was taking less than what he wanted, and he got uh, two white lights, and the jury again overturned it. So he was left with just one squat and just 310, which – uh, bottom line is in a 93 class of killers just wasn't going to cut it uh, for no. a person whose best lift is their squat. Um, having only 310 was just not going to be good enough. So at it's, that point, like it wasn't necessarily over from there, but it basically he basically uh, lost his chance to really contend for the gold. Like unless people after just messed up their bench that lift, which we know with Keiko is not going to happen. Yeah. Um, so second place ended up being Gustav Hedlund with 875. He had a good day. He went three for three on squats. He went two for three on bench and three for three on down. So for eight for nine, uh, pretty good day, 875, 12, uh, 13 kilos below Jonathan, but still a solid day. And then Emil uh, had a good comeback meet from Sheffield. Sheffield Coming to Sheffield, he might have been a bit hurt. Uh, definitely didn't have the day one in Sheffield. But here he uh, finished with 302.5 on squats, three for three. 232.5 on bench, three for three, and uh, just missed his third deadlift. So he went eight for nine of the day, finished with 872 and a half for a very good meet. Um, meaning Gustav actually, his last pull was to pull ahead, to pull into second. So he had a very good meet, wasn't as much, I think, as I think last year he had 877.5, if I'm not sure, something like that. Mm -hmm. So a little bit under that, but well above what he did in Sheffield. Yeah. And then coming in fourth was Sasha with 862.5. He uh, pulled 365 on his third um, to pull into that position with a big pull. And then Gavin uh, fell all the way to fifth. And then just one last note, in sixth was uh, uh, Carlos Griffith Peterson from Guyana. He was actually in the B flight, but he told 847 and a half with like a 355 pull, pretty big performance. Um, yeah, I believe he actually competed at Canadian nationals. I think he's in Canada for school, maybe. Um, so somebody could correct me if I'm wrong. No, you can't correct me. I'm not wrong. He's in, he's in, he definitely competed at Canadian nationals. I remember watching it cause he battled against, uh, against, uh, Kwaku Antwi, uh, who did represent Canada, but yeah. So, and then just the other lifters that were like in prime time to note, Christian, I, I, Ndokun, so he came in a bit hurt. He ended up, 
fall in a couple of places. And then Amar, um, who also was at Sheffield. So again, he did not get the world record squad again this time. And he fell down like all the way towards like first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. What is yeah, that? Ninth? ninth. Ninth. Yeah. And he ninth. did take the squad gold, but yeah, he. he yeah. But so that was basically a quick rundown. Like it wasn't, it wasn't um, the craziest class just because Keiko just had <clears throat> such a perfect day and was a bit better than everyone else, even if they had their best day and none of them necessarily had their best day. So it ended up being just like a little bit of the Keiko show. Gavin was the lightest lifter. And if he had hit his 342.5, his final pull, that would have pulled him into third place, I believe. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he, he, yeah, I mean, it wasn't close though. The mm -hmm. last pull yeah. wasn't close. Yeah. I mean, it's just another one of these heartbreaker situations for Gavin where you're just like, man, if he can just get his squat figured out, if he can just get it to IPF standard, if he can just like, you know, I know. So the thing was, was that, he was like dive bombing his first one. And then that's what led him to took a step because he's trying to get deeper. But then after that, he decided to go like the slow and control route and, you know, couldn't get deep enough on his third. So, I mean, it's just like, these are the kind of things like you don't want to be trying to figure that stuff out at the world championships. Like, you know, you need to be a hundred percent dialed like Keiko is, you know, where it's like you, you can do it in your sleep. Nothing changes. It's all good. Um, we talked to Joey afterwards, um, at the press conference with Keiko and he just kind of gave a little bit of some secrets away as to like how they were able to pull this off. Like, because just considering he was kind of grinding for his squats on uh, at Sheffield and it looked like he had maybe something in the tank on bench, but like he didn't have a ton left in the tank after Sheffield and they still were able to put another three keys or was it another two and a half keys on the, on the world record in such a short turnaround. And one of the things that he did was um, he just kind of like adjusted his squat so that he wouldn't be so, uh, like so back dominant. And then he wouldn't be as gassed out when it came time for deadlift. So it ended up working out like just perfectly, like how they had planned it out. Like that's the kind of stuff where you see like super high level coaching where it's like, let's make this little change. It's just a small tweak to get the bar kind of just off your back a little bit and get it more onto your quads. And then you can use your back on your deadlift. And, um, and Keiko also did a, a brilliant job. Like this is one of the fastest sessions, super fast. Cause this was a Euro sport session. So it was only like seven minute breaks. Um, uh, barely any time in between he's talking on the King of Lifts podcast that he basically was just like resting on his opening and second benches. Like, like he just kind of came out and I guess he yawned after one of them. And, <laughs> and it was like, because he was literally like trying to control his breathing and keeping himself like, like these opener in the second, I'm just trying to conserve energy. I'll blow up the third and then I'll get ramped up in time for deadlifts, you know, and, um, man, perfect execution. So, and again, shout out Nina for all the handling game day stuff that she does. Um, she did a really good job and she always does. That's like an ace up his sleeve that he's got uh, uh, like an extra uh, bullet in his gun that he can shoot is that he's got Nina by his side at all times. So one thing is always consistent, even if national team coaches change or other things change. So super cool. Anything else on that one? No, there was that, that basically covers it. All right. So um, let's move into uh, second to last day here, we got the 84s with our girl, the queen, Amanda Lawrence. We already, we don't need to go into too much detail on this. We, I already talked about what she did, like the spectacular performance that she put up. She won handily. Um, she went up against her, her athlete, uh, and Kristen Thorhall's daughter. So great, uh, cool little camaraderie. They didn't talk really almost at all until after the comp. Um, like she, I think, uh, Amanda would like give her a fist bump, like as, as she was coming through the tunnel and Amanda was like, um, you know, still getting ready to go out and lift on her next one. But then in the other side, on the men's side, we had the one Oh fives where we got our guy, Michael Davis, um, who finished in fourth. Um, and we haven't really talked too much about, so is there anything you want to say about the 84s real quick on a quick rundown? Uh, I guess I'll just do like a tiny quick, just point. Uh, so third and fourth came, uh, Zayana Azariah and, uh, Tamito Nuga, both from Great Britain. Mm -hmm. But just the one thing I'd mentioned from that, from watching is Zayana. So she pulled 247.5 for a third and she absolutely blew that up. Like she looked like she was good for like 260 or something. So she just has a massive deadlift and it's just something to watch for in the future. Yeah. Um, she's on the younger side. So same uh, age as Amanda. Yeah. Yeah. So she's been making the come up. So it's just something to note for, uh, for future future reference at something else Twitter. something else just looking at the sheet those british lifters went 18 for 18 
So um, pretty cool. Team UK there. Didn't miss a lift. Yeah. All right. Anything else about Amanda's performance? Um, I mean, we talked about it a lot. Like she was in high spirits, but she gets fired up and she wanted that last deadlift so bad. And she just kept saying, man, that one's going to eat me alive for the, until Sheffield, until I can write that wrong. Yeah. I mean, there's not much to add. Uh, she's just so dominant. The only thing she really had to battle here was her best lifter. Uh, she did like, she had a great performance coming in to uh, her third deadlift. She was eight for eight. She uh, stacked the chips. She loaded the bar and it was close, but just, it was a little bit too much on the day. But like, that's really all there is. She put up a phenomenal performance as usual. And just, there's like, it's in every single man, the performance is phenomenal. Like there's no, yeah. it's, it's really tough to um, have anything specific for one performance. She's just, she's so dominant in the weight class. Um, there hasn't been somebody to like compete with her since, da since Danny. Um, so, and I don't know when the next person will. Hopefully somebody will come sometime in the future just because it would make it more entertaining. I mean, we see what happens in some of these other classes when somebody comes to push them where just like, it just breeds like, ex like even more excellence, like just forces yeah. people to like, do things that we didn't think were possible. So, but for now it's just the man, the show and nothing more to say. I mean, she's not on cruise control by any means. She's pushing everything. And right. Like she, so I, I just think she's amazing. And um, getting to spend some time with her is the first time since the first PA Nats because she was at Sheffield. So she didn't have to do Nats. Um, just getting to spend like more time with her throughout the week and like after the comp and stuff like that. She's just a great person. She got a great personality. I mean, I just want to see more of Amanda Lawrence everywhere. Like, I think that she should be like the poster child of powerlifting. Um, and she just, she's got a great personality. I just want to like showcase it more and like get her more shine. Like it's crazy to think that someone who's a four-time world champion could be like underrated. But like, if you t think about like how many times she gets mentioned, um, in all these hype shows and things like this, um, it's, she doesn't get mentioned nearly enough as she should. And I think one thing is just like, I just want to see her just like do more social media stuff because man, she's got a great personality. Let's just put it out there more, you know? So. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I, I think she like, she got mentioned for a while and she just became so good that like, it's kind of like one of those, she became so good that like people kind of just got bored of talking about her. Like, yeah. Yeah. Not only was she so good overall, but she was just so good and there was just like no one close. So it was like, yeah, people got bored. But um, yeah, I mean, I think she's going to go down as one of the greatest female lifters ever when when she eventually does hang it up, which when won't she be anytime soon. But... When she hangs it up after getting 10 world titles, uh, as yeah. she kind of mentioned in her press conference. <laughs> Listen, not even halfway done. Yeah. Crazy. She All wants, right. She wants more rings than Phil Jackson. She'll get All it right. if she wants it. For sure. Um, yeah. So then the uh, second, se so that yeah. wasn't the prime time, actually. The prime time session that night was, oh, we had the yeah, you're right. We had the 105s and the 120s. So in the 105s, um, it was a little interesting. So we got like the rematch from Sheffield of Emil Norling, Mikey, and uh, uh, Abdul Suleiman from Great Britain, who was the late replacement. But in addition, we had a uh, previous best lifter at Worlds, Anatoly, coming back and joining them, as well as uh, Coco Clement and a few other lifters. So this session, um, I, I mean, I think a lot of people, myself included, kind of thought Anatoly was going to just a little bit run away with it if he was on, which he was. So Anatoly just had a phenomenal day. Uh, he took the squat world record with 362.5, which is just a tad under 800 pounds. I believe it's like 798 or 799 or something like that. And also he benched 225, so he got bench gold also. He deadlifted 352.5. He, he totaled 940, uh, I think it was the world record total, and he won by 35 keys. Then all three of the Sheffield lifters had a little bit of a down performance. Um, I think just like the long schedule, they were like a couple couple months after Sheffield. They had been doing meets like right before it. Um, Emil had just done Swedish National before that and Euros, and then Mikey – had done his meets. So they all took a little hit. Um, Emil finished with 905 in second. Mikey finished 885 in fourth. And Abdul Suleiman finished 880, which ended up being in sixth. Uh, seeking the third was Mohammed Abdullah Mohammed from Libya. He's actually one of the more interesting lifters to watch. He had this like super high bar, uh, narrow squat 
the super close grip bench, uh, conventional deadlift. But yeah, he had a very good day, 902.5. Um, uh, he was in second until Emil pulled for, for silver. And uh, Mikey finished 85. Yeah, so that was basically the breakdown. There was no real battle for gold. The only real battle was a little battle for uh, silver between Emil and and um, Mohammed Abdullah. And then there was a little battle for fourth and fifth between Mikey and Coco. Uh, yeah. They both finished with 885, and neither of them ended up coming out for their third deadlifts. They were both gassed. And uh, hopefully they're both going to – I mean, especially Coco also. He's been doing all those meets and the junior stuff. They're both like – they're all gassed. I think, honestly, basically all these lifters just need a long off season, like yeah. take off literally until next worlds or whatever, like at least take six to eight months off and rebuild because all these lifters are capable. They might not be capable of totaling 940 like Anatoly, but they're all capable of totaling 920 or something like that. And none of them really came close to that on this day. So yeah. I think they just need some time off. And then uh, in the 120s, we didn't have any lifters and it wasn't Wait, real the, quick. Real quick, I'll just say something about Mikey. Um, you know, the heart of a champion for one. Um, uh, for two, his bench was messed up because they were complaining about his feet not being totally flat and like that little bit of a tweak. Uh, and he kind of had to do something slightly different in his setup. And then he thought he was really good for 220, uh, 2.5, um, which would have been an extra five keys there. Um, uh, but in the end, you know, there was a pretty big gap, like uh, 17 keys between him and third. So it ended up not really mattering too much. And he was just trying to secure position over Coco. And they both kind of just threw in the towel there on the final deadlift. But um, but Mikey, I mean, he, he's just such a great guy, man. Like it was just cool to, again, to be around him for that session um, to just like see someone like he just one of you'll never find anyone who has anything bad to say about Michael Davis, you know? And um, it, he just brought that great spirit, even though he's always banged up and he's tired and he's been put through the ringer. Um, like he just, he came through with just um, a, a great spirit on the day. And then, you know, didn't have the day that he wanted, but he left it all out there and he's proud of it. So, uh, but he did say in his press conference afterwards that, there's only one thing that he wants and that's a world title. So, I mean, he's going to keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. So he won't quit. All right. So on the one twenties, let's bust through that real quick. Yeah. So just quick one twenties. Um, honestly, it wasn't, it wasn't much of a battle when you look at the end results, but um, there are basically, I guess a few people have note, but Tony cliff won it with nine fifty two point five. 52.5. Um, he was, it was a little close for most of the beginning with him and Mohammed Tahad from Algeria. But after second deadlifts, Tony Cliff basically uh, pulled away and took the win. Um, Tahad had a really nice performance. He, uh, he squatted 375. Um, he might have had more. He opened with 360. He got called, I think, for depth. Uh, I'm not sure it was close. He retook it, hit it, took 375 hit it nicely. Like he might've had like, I don't know, 390 on the day. So he's a insane, insane, uh, squatter. Uh, but then Tony Cliff like regained the ground with a 242.5 bench. Um, and then coming in third was Indy from, uh, Great Britain. He's a big puller. He squatted 340, only bench 180, which is like way behind, uh, these higher lifters, but he pulled I mean, 386 dude, for a world. Record. But that's, that's 42 kilos. Yeah. No, uh, 60, 62. 62 kilos behind Tony Cliff. Like, man, Indy's, you got He's got to get his bench up, man. Yeah. When you just By look way, at him, you would never guess that he would have. Yeah. A, so I, he looks right, like I a big, remember seeing, I yeah. saw him in the venue one of the earlier days and I saw him. I'm like, I'm like, oh, that's the bearded warrior. Like that's yeah. the Instagram name is the bearded warrior. And that dude is absolutely, he's massive. Yeah. He's like way bigger in person than like I would have guessed. So like yeah, I'm surprised his bench. I, but the answer is he definitely has long arms. Like he's a deadlifter, so he probably yeah. takes a little hit. But he pulled 386 for a world record deadlift. Uh, I believe taking Bryce Krawchick's, uh world record deadlift. So he took that for the world record deadlift, which also pulled him into third uh, ahead of uh, Nico Perud from France, who finished the day with 895 total. And then also with 895 was uh, Victor uh, Vasquez from Spain who mm -hmm. um, also finished there. So that was basically the 120s. All right. Then that leaves us with only the final day here where we had some fireworks. 
in the 84 plus. We talked about it kind of a lot because we talked about it uh, in part one about the whole Bonica bomb out and just the whole, like whether that makes it more special, that fact that she was there and like Brittany had to do it, you know, beat her in order to take the title uh, back again, you know, and all of this. So we don't need to go too long on it, but um, you know, that session. And then we had, Hey Zeus coming through, you know, strongest man in the world to wrap it up. So go ahead with the 84, 84 plus. So even though we discussed it, I'm going to go go over it again a little bit just because the right. session was too good. So the 84 plus is um, we had just a crazy session from every aspect. I mean, we had a bomb out. We had world records. We had like pulled for win everything. So it started off crazy with squats. Um, on squats, we just have like looking at openers, you just saw like it was going to be crazy. Like the amount of people opening with like 240 plus was a lot you come into second attempts and already on second attempts um we're, we already had we had uh, uh we already had two world lifters record. yeah bonica already took the world record uh 280.5 on her second attempt and then we also already had um uh um sona uh loaded 277.5 so we're in another lifter in the sec in the 600 on seconds yeah. then we come to thirds and literally it's just I mean, it's just insanity. So first we had, um, we had uh, Jewel Tassie from New Zealand load 611 for her third squat. She hits it. Next up, we have uh, Brittany. So she loads uh, 281 kilos, um, some crazy number to temporarily take the world record who, who, from Bonica. Then we have uh, Sonita. She loads 285.5. She doesn't chip it. She goes up another four and a half kilos and she takes the world record. Then Bonica's like, no, 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 this is mine. So she doesn't chip it. She goes to 289. For reference, that, was, that is what? That is it. That is that was a chip on uh on uh Sonitas, by the way. 285.5 no. and then no, no 289. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Three and a half sorry. kilos. Whoops. Yeah, I'm seeing 288.5. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. 289 that is 290. that's like 636 pounds or something like that crazy thing and she also hit it so we just saw the, the world record squat like get passed around we saw like seven squats over 600 pounds it was insane then we go into all four of those women that you mentioned there all went three for three right yeah they're yeah good. i mean literally there was only there was only one third squat that was missed by somebody who bombed out, missed all three. Like yeah. every single other third squat was hit. Like that's when, and we're that's talking big cool. numbers. So that's like, that's a pretty uh, impressive like session. Then we go to bench and uh, bench was a little bit less exciting. We had, um, so 155 bench for Brittany, um, a 160 bench from Emile Mergier. Uh, 142.5 from Sonita and then 152.5 from Bonica. So after bench, uh, it's a tight three-way battle at the top. Um, Brit um, Bonica has a slight lead. Brittany was in second and Sonita was in third with uh, Jewel a bit behind them. Um, and then coming to deadlifts. So deadlifts, Bonica raised her opener from 235 to 240 because she wanted to be in a slightly uh, better position. She believed that she wanted to extend her lead at the beginning, which ended up costing her. So she missed her, her first one. Uh, she got three reds, I believe, on the first one. You saw, it, you saw it from the front. What did you think? Yeah, the, the first one was like shaky. I didn't think, I didn't think the first one was good. It's just the lockout, the shoulders or something. Yeah. It was just like a, a little of everything, honestly. Okay. Um, meanwhile, Brittany opens with 235 and smokes it. And then uh, Sonita opens with 245 and hits it. Then following them all at 258 was uh, Natalie Lalai from Australia. She opened with the world record deadlift. Crazy. Uh, she hits it. So Amazing. deadlifts are getting excited. Now, uh, Bonica missed her opener, so she has to retake it, and she's already now she's already fallen from first to third, uh, based off having to retake it. So she retakes it. Uh, she gets two whites. I thought it was a good lift. Um, the jury uh, disagreed and overturned it. It was, I don't know, 
it looked good to me. I think most people that saw it thought, thought it was good. The jury was being strict and I guess whatever reasons, I'm not going to get into it, but they overturned it. Mm -hmm. uh, Brittany loaded 247.5. She hit it. Then um, Sonita loaded 260.5 for the world record deadlift and she hit it. And then Natalie Lalai loaded 268 to smash that world record deadlift. Damn. And now coming to third deadlifts, at this point, uh, Bonica's basically out of it because unless she was going to try to jump, she was already behind these lifters and she didn't have a deadlift in yet. So she reloads 240 again. And this time she switches to conventional. She puts on heels. She tries to change it up, but it just wasn't there on the day. And she bombed out. And then Brittany goes next and hits 257.5 to shatter the world record total and have 693.5 total. Wow. Now, this is where things get slightly interesting. So now, <clears throat> Sonita now is forced to load 267.5. Because the world record that Lift had already been taken, she no longer can use the chip. Normally, you think when you're taking something 10 kilos over the world record that Lift, you'd have your chips. But she already lost it earlier to uh, Natalie. So she takes it, and I think she gets two reds. I'm not sure if it was two reds and, and didn't get overturned or two whites and got overturned. Uh, I believe it was two reds and they go to the jury, but it, it stays two reds. So she ends up finishing second with a 688.5. And um, yeah, so that finished the day. So Brittany takes gold, 693.5. Sonita takes silver, 688.5, both over the previous world record. And coming in third was Jewel with 647.5. Uh, Emile was Emile Mergier 642.5 and 640.5 for Natalie Lalai. So it was, it was a, uh, it was a pretty crazy session. And yeah, yeah. that's a lot of like, you know, a lot of lifters 640 and up there. Um, yeah. What is that? You know, if you add Bonica in there, like that's six lifters in the session that are 640 and up. This is crazy. Like this, this weight class is definitely one of the ones to watch going forward. It's going to get more and more stacked. You got some veterans in there, like Brittany Schlater, Emily Mergier. You got some newcomers in here, like uh, Natalie Lalai. And uh, I think Jewel uh, Tossi is like pretty young as well. And then Sonita is like pretty new to the sport as well. So, and then of course we got our young superstar in the U S Alexis Jones, talking about coming over and challenging with these ladies yeah. as well. I mean, this is one of these weight classes that's going to be so fun to watch for years to come. And they're all going to be hitting these crazy numbers. And it's just, I think it's really good for the sport. Like you said, um, seeing a bunch of women hit like 600 pound squats and stuff like this. And then eventually we'll be also pulling in the 600s probably um, like, it's going to be, it's going to be spectacular. So it's great for the sport. It's good to see it was a tough day for, Bo for Bonica. Obviously we love her. And we know she'll bounce back. She's has nothing left to prove in the sport. So, you know, but yet she will come back and will be fired up and will be ready to defend, um, at PNX. So, all right. Um, anything else, any thoughts about talking to Bonica afterwards and like, or even just like, so, like days after I, I haven't really talked to her much, like since afterwards, yeah. um, I just like, I mean, she'll be back, and I, this class is not – it's not a one-time battle. This class is going to be a class that's going to be exciting for the near future. Uh, like you said, we have Alexis coming over. Um, you mentioned, like, six people over 640, and I think uh, for Sweden, Emily Leach, who's usually there and, like, usually battling wasn't there this year. Um, Alexis has a bigger total than any of them. Obviously, it wasn't done in international competition, but – yeah, um, and she's going to also have to adapt to the bench rules, uh, which is going to hurt her a little bit. But, yeah. I mean – this class is going to be a class that's just going to be exciting. I think for a while now it's pushing like boundaries, like that are insane. The total, the world record total was like 660, like a year and a half ago. And yeah. now we're talking about like next year, maybe having like three or four lifters, like pushing in the 700s, which I think is just like, it's just insanity. Crazy. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's going to be 650 and up in the whole, the whole flight. And then it's going to be like multiple people over 700. So. Yeah. I, I think like, I think Maybe like 600 three. squats will be like, you'll have, which is so crazy. Like 600 squats is going to be like everybody in the flight, which is crazy to think about just because like yeah. what makes it so exciting besides for the fact that it's like a great battle and over the world record. It's like any person, whether it's any power lifter watching from home, any gym bro, anybody, 
anybody watching this, sometimes they don't like watching certain classes because like it doesn't seem so crazy. There's no person out there, or if there is, then I don't care about them. There shouldn't be any person out there that can't respect a 600 pound squat, like male, female, 600 pounds is a respectable squat for any person, for any man of any weight. Forget about like woman, 600 pounds is 600 pounds of my lifetime goal on squats. And these people are like taking it like easily, like they're pushing well into the 600s. So I just, it's yeah. beyond my lifetime goal, brother. All right. Uh, we won't get into the R lifting, but um, let's go move on. Yeah, it's exciting for the future of that class, but let's move on to the 120 pluses and wrap this show up. So to finish off, we got the 120 pluses, uh, a little similar to the 84s. This class is not the most exciting just because we have somebody who's so far ahead of the competition and his name is Jesus. No, Jesus Olivares uh, coming yeah. off. We spoke a little bit about this before coming off like his insane performance at Sheffield. So he wasn't going to replicate that here for multiple reasons. First off, just like it was really, really quick turnaround and there was no need to. But um, he wanted to, on an ideal day, if things were good, he would have pushed for the squat world record, which honestly is not worth it for him, like financially. Yeah. Um, but either way, uh, things were running really quick. It wasn't necessarily, he, he wasn't necessarily the strongest on the day. And even if he was, things were going really fast. So he took a thousand for a second attempt. It was okay. Like he definitely had a little bit in the tank, but it wasn't like crazy. So he just, he passed on his third and then bench things didn't go. So while, um, on his opening bench, um, he hit the rack or something. Yeah. So he he clipped the rack. He got the lift, like he got it pretty easily, but he clipped, clipped the rack and got reds and then retook his 250 for a second got it, and then jumped to 267.5 for his third and clipped the rack again. So I don't know, something was weird. I don't know if there was something off with the setup or maybe like the handoffs were bad because he kept clipping the rack. Yeah, he's but, he's training on a like TSS rack a lot, I think. Like we got to get yeah. him on a Aleko uh, for his bench training because it's that's the one thing like you can squat on a on a on uh, any rack and it's not going to feel that much difference, but the bench is different. Like you kind of, you want to have that dialed. Um, when it matters the most, which will be at Sheffield for him. So yeah, I mean, but like he, he had a great day at Sheffield on bench, so it was just yeah. a little weird on the day. But something, something, yeah, yeah. But that was like, and then deadlifts uh, again. So he took, um, he took three fifty for his opener, smoked it three seventy five second, and then jumped for the world record deadlift from the third, just because like he felt like he wanted to give something like some kind of show. He loaded four ten point five. He got it to lock out, but um. He got three reds. There was a whole weird thing in the venue where like, like they put up a thing that the jury had overturned it, but there were three reds. So it didn't go to the jury. I don't know how that happened. Like, I don't know what happened, whether that was a troll or whatever. It was, yeah, it was really funny though. I was like, there's three reds. So obviously it's not real, but like, I was wondering what, what happened. I still don't know what happened. It was so um, funny because like I was with him and Will who was handling him and I'm like filming him or whatever. And then um, all of a sudden, you see him like look around like and they're like wait what like what i got it you know i got it and he just goes running like he goes like i never seen a big man like i never seen him move that fast running through the tunnel he's gonna run out there and like shake the referee's hands or something he's all the way back out like on the platform and they're like no no it's it, it was three reds bro like like and and, and they waved Do you him know down what happened? they Do waved you know what him happened? off no, I don't know what happened, but they just, I know they waved him down. And then he, he like, he's like, oh damn. And like comes like, like walking back okay. kind of like, I'm going to I'm, I'm gonna have to clip this part and post it. Cause I want to find out if there's anybody who does know what happened because yeah. obviously you can't overturn a three red light lift, but it was really funny. And I really am curious what happened, but either way, so it was the Jesus show. And it and was crazy was- though, because like he knew, he, he knew he didn't get it. Like he dropped it. Like, I think is right. what it was, right? Like he, he just put it down like a split second. He just barely beat. And I think he said like, he was just being cautious because the whole thing with Jesus is like, you're moving around these massive weights. So this is a world record deadlift here. And it flew off the floor. I thought he for sure was going to lock it out and have a clean lift, but you know, something was just a little bit off. And so he just let go of it and rather than injure himself and possibly like, you know, be on this slow road to recovery all the way through Sheffield. He wanted to come out of this meet healthy. That was goal number one. And that's what he did. And I want to say like, it's a lot of maturity because like the crowd was going crazy. He pulls up, he hits that 455 squat over a thousand. And I think a, a younger Jesus with more of an ego 
would have like the way that crowd was screaming for him and everything like that. And the way it was on Eurosport and stuff would have came back out and forced the issue for something, you know, at least, you know, another 10, 15 keys, whatever, and tried to grind something out. And he just didn't need to do that. And that was a really smart decision. And he knew it coming right off the platform before he even got back in the tunnel, he said, shut it down. Um, right. and it was just like, that's smart, man. He's maturing. He's becoming a smarter lifter, um, as well as be getting stronger and stronger. Um, and then, yeah, you know, still want to put on a show, just a great guy, a uh, little bit of color for this one, uh, after squat, you know, this session's moving fast. This is on Eurovision Eurosport. There's only seven minutes or something in between squat and bench. And actually team USA, we had a secret bathroom that was a little closer, um, in the front, uh, you know, it was like in the front of the uh venue not in the back where the main bathroom was and it was a smaller bathroom only had a couple stalls wasn't as luxurious but from the warm-up rack that we were on it was actually a little bit closer than walking all the way around to the other one it was like maybe like might have been like 20 seconds closer not much but <laughs> okay still so jesus goes over there and i'm filming him interviewing him on my phone you know like how's it how's it feeling champ you know and everything he's giving me a little interview and everything we turn the camera off and he's, and I'm like, I'm like, all right, man, I'm going to be your bodyguard now. Like a joke, because like, as if this man needs me, little right. me to be his bodyguard. And he goes, actually, you know, I might need, uh, I might need you to just like, make sure no one tries to take selfies with me because the last time I came out here, cause this was like, you're basically exiting the venue and you're back into like where the elevators are. And there's a ton of people always mingling around over there. And he was, and that's where that, that other bathroom was. Oh, and I know. Okay, I know yeah. Bathroom. So he's like, he's like, uh, yeah, just don't let anyone take selfies with me. I'm like, all right, you got it. And I'm like waiting outside the bathroom like this, you know, like with my arms crossed, like I'm his bodyguard or something comes back in and who is there to ask for a selfie is Moro, uh, the meat director who oh, okay. is like done everything for us the whole time. And, and he has his kids there and they're like two or three young kids. I don't remember how many, and they're like little kids. And they're like, can we get, he, and Moro's like, Paul, can we get a selfie with Jesus? You know, he's asking me and I'm just like, oh man, Moro did everything for me. This competition, he literally bent over backwards for us constantly. So it broke my heart to have to be like, no, unfortunately he, he can't do any selfies right now. We'll come back and do it later. And Jesus is like, no, 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 it's okay. It's all good. I'll do the selfie for the kids, you know? He, and then, so he does a selfie and then I'm interviewing him on the way back. And he's like, I got nephews that are that age and stuff. He's like, I can never say no to the kids, you know? And it's just like, man, that's why he's got a heart of gold. That's why everyone loves him. Um, and Moro was like, oh, he didn't even realize that he was in session right then. He was actually between squat and bench right, right. And, and for a big man. Um, this is a lot. This is a long way to go. There's a lot to do. Is wasted a lot of time and everything like this. Like it takes him time to warm up all all this. Uh, you know, because he lifts so much, he needs his time. So anyway, it was just a crazy like little caveat that happened in between. Like, and, we, and that's all on our story. You can go back and look under the Malta highlight. You'll see that. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, it was just one of the coolest things. And just also, uh, Saria, shout out to his partner Saria, who is also like Nina, a game day handler for him, doing everything like holding his food, his chalk bowl, all this kind of fanning him down the whole time because it's hot. Um, just doing like, she was the best fanner of the entire competition, but hands, hands down. Um, she was on it from like start to finish, just like fanning him like crazy. Um, and yeah, it was just a cool, it was a cool session in a way because the Bonica stuff was going down and it was like, that was like so intense. And then over here you had like, Jesus is just chilling. Right. right. It was just like, yeah, he's just yeah. sort of like, he's just sort of like, if I can, I'm going to take what's there and just be really smart and just take what's there, not push it, not be an ego lifter. Um, and that's exactly what he did. And he still won by damn near hundred kilos. You know, I think it was a, his third title. Um, yeah, yeah. Third world championship. So he checked all the boxes. He handled business, um, put on a show for the people with a thousand pound squat and trying for that big dead at the end. So just all around, amazing guy he did all the press stuff we asked him to do you know before during after the competition all that um so just great guy and and couldn't you know couldn't be uh more proud of him and then also just more grateful just to be in his presence it was amazing yeah just quick uh note a few other lifters that did stuff so um Ilias from uh algeria so he benched 280 kilos he loaded um he loaded 292 for the world record, but didn't get it. And then um, Tamor, uh, the the junior from Georgia, so he loaded 382.5 for his third deadlift to uh, take silver with a 982 and a half total. And then Chenk, 
uh, low to 390, but the judges didn't give it to him. I'm not exactly sure why, but so he finished in bronze with a 980 total. So that was basically just the wrap up of the other lifters, yeah. but it was the Jesus show and that was really the focus. I would say, I mean, we've been staring at these good lift sheets. Um, and if anyone goes uh, to good, to good lift and then goes to results, you can see these exactly what we're basing all of this discussion off of. And if you see the sea of red in here, like this, this flight, the 120 pluses, there's noticeably like a lot of red spread out amongst the top lifters spread out across squat, across bench and across deadlift. Um, if we look at the 84 pluses, not the, not as much the case. The top on is a sea of green on squats. I mean, bar barely any missed squats. There's like one, two, three missed squats, and then a person who bombed out. So six missed squats only um, on the 84 plus. And like, uh, who knows what what, what it is for, for specifically the prime time session, which was the one that was going fast. But a sea of green on squats, only a couple missed benches, and then some some you know a smattering of reds there in in both bench and deadlift. But um, if pace really was affecting anyone and you're just glancing at this stuff it affected the 120 plus is the most uh, i think i think when you just look at the amongst the best of the best in there a lot of reds scattered out i, I also just think there's like other factors that like you have to keep in mind which is number one is there are certain lifters who train faster than others also there are certain lifters who open lighter so the ones who open lighter and like were kind of able to be more relaxed probably didn't get affected as much the ones who opened like heavy so then they're taking like three heavy attempts really quickly. So I think yeah. that kind of killed them. So that, that's another really great point about like how to handle pace. One is training. Two is good attempt selection. Because if you're, if you're going out there opening super heavy and then having to turn around and hit a super heavy second attempt, you're going to be gassed. Like, and we kind of yeah. saw it with Delaney, like on his third deadlift. Like that was kind of what happened to Delaney on deadlifts. Um, Actually one of the worst I saw, I forgot who was some, one of the people in the prime time session. I don't remember which one. They opened really heavy on squats and they got called for depth. But then most people hit, everyone else hit their openers and jumped and he had to retake it. So he went from being like second to last in the fight to like third. So he had like three minutes, literally. Yeah. So like, yeah. that's brutal. Like, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, the pace is something else. Um, all right. So any final thoughts, any, any, you know, wrap up, like this is your second world championships. You went to the junior world championships last year in Turkey, right? Have you been to any others before that? So no, I haven't been to any others besides for that. Um, my just general thoughts were, um, obviously like the venue is very, the venue is very nice. Uh, the one thing I would change is they should probably have a bath. Like they had a bathroom that was close, but Wada was using it. Yeah. So they should really fix that just because it could be a big inconvenience. Yeah. Um, but the venue was really nice. The city was really nice. Um, I think everything was ran pretty well. Uh, I already mentioned my thoughts on the jury earlier, so we're not going to yeah. discuss that already. Um, but basically overall, I think it was ran, ran very well. It was a very nice experience for, for me. And I think m most of the athletes who were there or anybody who saw it, like everyone thought it was a pretty good experience. And then we had pretty good lifting. So I think yeah. overall, it was really good and it was definitely an experience that I enjoyed and would like to have in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Me too. It was my first world championships. The only other international competition I've been to was in Panama last year for NAPF, which was way crazier um, because it, there was just so many more lifters because there's juniors, sub juniors, classic oh, equipped. Right. They used, uh, masters. World used to be like that. Yeah. I could only imagine what it would be like because it was already insane enough. This was still um, for us, it was a marathon. It wasn't a sprint. Like we were doing stuff like pregame shows, postgame press conferences, pre competition press conferences and portraits two days out, um, uh, in advance. And just like, we were just, we were just burning the candle at both ends too. Then we we're going, you know, by the time we got done with all these super late sessions, we'd have to go by the time you could go get dinner, it'd be 2 AM. And then, you know, and then you, you, you know, we celebrated with Meg and Meg and their crew and just like, there's just, but it was a great experience, man. And, um, having you there was, was a huge blessing. Um, it was, it was awesome. Like you did great work the whole time. Like even now, like running through this recap with you and just like remembering about all the experiences that we had, it was like, it's just, it was great. It, and, um, thank you so much. I really appreciate everything that you add. And, uh, I'm going to, I, I mean, now I'm like dependent on you for press conference questions, like for pregame shows, for these recap shows. So it's like, man, let's keep doing this and let's keep pushing because you definitely made a big difference. And, um, you know, it, that's just what it takes is just showing up and putting in the work and people are recognizing it. So anyway, thank you again for all the hard work that you did. 
Um, I also want to shout out Luke Mellon, Madeline Fitch, Julia Williams. They're the ones that were on the clipping team that was doing all the clipping of the live stream and posting those reels in real time when the internet, when Instagram wasn't down for the one session and when Natalie's uh, squats weren't being like uh, sketchy on the live stream and, and, and whatever, but they did a, like a, a brilliant job on that. Like they were on point the whole time. They never got any numbers wrong in the captions. Um, and they were posting it right in real time. Amanda was like, like watching the replay on her phone from our Instagram, um, it, like, like in real time, like in the back in the warm-up room, like, and, and I think in one of the videos you can see her doing it, you can see her, um, checking it out and everything like that. So it was like really cool. The athletes really appreciate it. So thank you to them. Like for some of those sessions, they were crazy times here in the U S a lot of them, they were at normal times for the East coast people like noon, one, two, whatever. Um, but you know, Julia's on the West coast, Luke's in mountain times, like so they're all over the place. So they had to coordinate and do a lot of work. Um, and then also, uh, shout out Emmanuel Schreiber. He's the one that got us the media room and basically just gave us a free pass to like, just do whatever we wanted media wise, Eric Rupp on the media team with the IPF. And then Moro Gasson, who ran, I think just a spectacular meet. Like I've been to a lot of meets, um, not a lot of world championships is my first one, but like to run something so logistically complicated and for it to just be like smooth as silk. Um, like, man, no question. They're, they're going to run this back next year. Junior worlds is going to be there at Malta. Um, so oh, that's official? Uh, I believe, uh, Eleni told me she saw it on good I haven't actually checked it, but, um, I've heard the rumors that that was what it was going to be. And then Eleni told me about it out of nowhere. So I think it's, it's official. Um, okay. so, so that's a sign that he did a really, really good job. Him and his whole crew, obviously it's not just him. Um, but, um, just fantastic job. Uh, the U S national coaches, Mike Z handle business, uh, getting the team points, winning it back-to-back -back championships, sweeps, back-to-back -back sweeps. Um, Rodney Elm was also there back-to-back -back as an assistant coach, Tamara Lopes coming in. At, uh, this was her first time back into coaching. So she was a big help, but also shout out Mike Z for just not just, being the head coach. He was also the executive director of power of the America while he was there having meetings about us hosting bench worlds, going to the general assembly host, having meetings with the, uh, the everyone around in the IPF to talk about all kinds of things. And then he was also part of our media team. He was running all the live streams. He was setting up, doing all the tech and stuff. I, we drove him crazy with tech problems. I mean, there was adapters. Hey, the, whenever by he was there, we, it didn't say, work. It, it did, when he wasn't there, it didn't work out. So I guess we needed him there. It, it didn't work sometimes when he was there. Sometimes it didn't work when he wasn't there. It was a crapshoot. It wasn't really anyone's fault. Like the, we were using adapters. There was only a handful of outlets. We have all American style outlets, uh, plugs, and then put him in these other adapters that would fall out of the socket. Just, it was, it was our first time doing this. And um, we all worked super hard. And uh, Mike Z was like really doing a lot. Like he, he was doing head coaching and doing all these, he was wearing a lot of hats. Um, so, um, but Hey, we pulled it off and he was pushing us. Like he was pushing us to do better and do more on the pregame shows. Like he was head coach of the media team as well. Like he was pushing us to our limits um, to the point where we're like, we can't do this much, Mike, we can't do this much media. And yet we still did it. And we, we didn't have, we didn't miss a single pregame show or a single press conference, anything like that. So um, it was awesome. Overall, amazing experience. Shout out, obviously, last but not least, you know, really should be first and foremost, all the athletes uh, from all the countries, but especially for our athletes, they gave us the time of day every time we asked for it. No, none of them put up any kind of fuss about having to do all this media stuff that we made them do. And, um, you know, some of them actually really appreciated it and everything as well. And they just showed out and they were just great people to hang out with. So it was fun. And um, everyone else that we saw out there, you know, uh, it was a pleasure meeting you as well. And, um, all right. Any other final thoughts from you while I rambled on through all those thank yous? I, I think we covered everything at this point. <laughs> I think so too, bro. All right, homie. Um, thank you. Thank you to Julia Williams uh, for being here. And thank you to everyone who listens to the power of Teen America podcast. Peace. <laughs>